welcome to the EcoCast by Actual Tech Media. Our topic today, wrangling passwords, authentication, and identity keys to success. My name is Jess Steinbach with Actual Tech Media, and I'm so excited to be your moderator for this EcoCast along with Scott Becker, who will be joining us in just a moment. Now, there's a lot to cover in this exciting EcoCast today, and we have some absolutely fascinating experts and innovators here from Ping Identity, Okta, 1Password, CyberArk, and Beyond Identity, who will help us navigate this important conversation. With so much info to cover, I'm going to keep my intro short and sweet and get into the good stuff. Now, if you have not joined us for an EcoCast in the past, a very special welcome to all you first-timers out there. Actual Tech Media created the EcoCast and our Megacast series to help educate IT professionals like yourself on the latest innovations and trends in enterprise technology. These webinars are designed to get you the hottest insights and up-to-date information efficiently from the comfort of your own home or office. Now, before we get into our sessions here today, there are a few things that you should know about this EcoCast. Now, of course, if your eyes went right to that little prize icon, don't worry. I'm going to come back to those in just a moment. But first, I want to draw your attention over to the questions tab in your webinar control panel. Now, make sure to say hi to your friends in the actual tech media community. We love seeing you all connect. And that questions console is also a great place to let us know about any technical issues that might come up today. I do want to remind you all that a browser refresh is going to fix just about any of the usual tech gremlins. Uh, but if not, throw a little comment or question in that questions tab and the actual tech media crew will be there to help. Now, most importantly, we want this to be an informative and engaging webinar for you today, which means that we want those technical questions. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll be sure to ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you during the actual live webinar, uh, we'll also have dedicated Q&A sessions. And if we don't get to your question during the webinar, don't worry. The awesome humans from Ping Identity, Okta, 1Password, CyberArk, and Beyond Identity will be following up with you afterwards. Now, I promise that this webinar is going to be filled with lots of aha moments, so be sure to share those with your friends. You can use that Twitter button that's right there in your audience console, and the hashtag for today's webinar will automatically be added to your post. Okay, now while you're exploring that audience console with me, we were just in the questions tab, look one tab over and you can see that handout section. You're going to find some fantastic resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. There's just an awesome collection, data sheets, solution briefs, white papers, ebooks, demos, and more. So head on over to that handout section and make sure to download those resources to look at after the webinar today. Now, it is not just awesome content that we are giving away here. We also have three $500 Amazon gift cards that we will be giving away to three lucky winners here. Now, of course, you must be in attendance at the live webinar to qualify for the prize, and you must meet all of actual tech media prize terms and conditions, which you can find if you go back to that handouts tab uh, and scroll all the way down to the bottom. The full T's and C's are listed there. And as I mentioned earlier, we love getting your questions. In fact, we love it so much that we want to give you a little bit of an extra boost and incentive to get those digital hands up today. So we are also giving away a $50 Amazon gift card to the best question asked. Now that's in each session. So we've got five sessions today. That means there's five of these gift cards. We are reviewing all of the questions after the webinar wraps. So you will have a chance even if we don't read your question out or, or get to your question during the live event, there's still a chance that you can win that. So this is an awesome one. Now I've got a few reminders for the T's and C's up on this slide here. Uh, again, if you're curious about the full thing, head on over to that handouts tab and you can check that out there. Uh, all prize winners are required to submit an IRS form W9 to Actual Tech Media. Okay, now if you are a winner here today, you always have the option to donate the value of the prize to one of our selected charities, and you can see them up on the screen here. Thanks to generous prize winners on previous actual tech media webinars, thousands of dollars have been donated to these charities. So if you are a winner today and you'd like to get involved with one of these wonderful organizations, please let us know because we would love to help make that happen. Now, as I mentioned, we're pretty excited that you're here with us today. We want to keep those good times going, so let's connect on social media. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. We definitely want to hear from you. Also, check us out on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. We've got lots of great content on LinkedIn, so definitely worth checking out there. If you haven't visited the Gorilla Guide Book Club, uh, this club gives you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts, so you can stay up to date on all of the trending enterprise technology. 
These books are going to work on your Kindle. They'll work on your mobile device. And as I said, completely free. So you can download these exciting resources at GorillaGuide.com. There's a link in that Handouts tab for you as well. I told you that Handouts tab, jam-packed with excitement. Now, if you're loving this session already and you're excited about it, might as well share that. It's also another chance to win a prize. Uh, so be sure to refer an IT friend or a coworker uh, to the actual Tech Media Online event series or a webinar series. Now, I do want to assure you all, because I know this is a fear, we don't spam your friends. We send them one little email. If they don't respond, we send them a tiny, tiny reminder, and then that's it. So they're not going to get inundated with invites. But hey, we run some great programs here. I really think your friends would enjoy them. And then both of you are entered for a drawing to win a $300 Amazon gift card, which we hold every month. So just a win-win opportunity here. So make sure you take advantage of that. There's a link in the handouts section, and you'll also get redirected at the end of the webinar today. Okay. Well, you know, we're here today to talk about passwords, authentication, and identity. And it's a funny thing because everyone seems to agree that these are important and, and really you know, ubiquitous in our lives these days. But at the same time, a lot of organizations kind of have this set it and forget it mentality. So do we have passwords? Do we require passwords? Yep, okay, cool, check, done and dusted, right? But there's a lot of things to consider and explore, and in an ongoing and iterative way. And that includes new and innovative solutions, evolving security risks, and of course, the human element. So Scott and I wanted to start out the day today by digging into the humanity of passwords, or maybe the lack thereof. So one moment, because Scott and I are going to step on screen, and we're going to dig into this with you. Well, hey, Scott, and thanks for coming to chat with us today about passwords. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Now, I'm guessing that for some of you in our audience today, that topic sends chills down your spine because whether you're in charge of implementing password security policies, updating passwords, or you're just a human being functioning in this world, my guess is that you've had some experiences with passwords and not all of them have been pleasant. Scott, how about you? How many passwords or authenticated logins do you think that you use on, on any given day? Just ballpark on average. Yeah, so it's, you know, speaking as a human being, uh, you know, trying to act in the world, as you mentioned, um, you know, I probably use my thumbprint to get into my iPhone 30 times a day. Um, and then, you know, using a password manager on various sites uh, with automated logouts, um, probably 20 times a day, and then maybe typing in another three or four passwords on, on various things that the password manager doesn't catch. Yeah, uh, yeah, that sounds same here. I mean, I, I think I was thinking about my number and I, I know that I probably use about five passwords just in the first few minutes, maybe in the first hour of getting out of bed in the, in the morning. And, and that's not even including, you know, you're using your thumbprint. I use the face recognition. And I have to say, I do find it a little annoying that in the morning in, when I'm kind of like tr trying not to really look at my phone, I don't really want to open my eyes. My phone doesn't register my sleepy face as my actual <laughs> face. So I, I think that's a little bit insulting. I think I'm a little, I'm a little I think you should be insulted by your phone, definitely. Thank you, yes, yeah, as a general rule. Um, well, Scott, I remember you saying a few months ago in another keynote that we were doing that every so often, like clockwork, a, a solution, a company, a publication comes out with this bold statement that passwords are finally dying. But here we are and here they are. So what gives? Are, are passwords here to stay? And, and if so, why? They're just really hard to eliminate. You know, a lot of the solutions were dependent on the idea that we're, you know, really talking about a corporate network. So, you know, this was before, you know, a lot of the cloud stuff, you know, people were driving toward eliminating passwords. And then as those solutions started to mature, the corporate networks, you know, as sort of the entity, uh, you know, where people worked was dissolving, um, you know, as, as the source of work log on. So that's sort of how we're at zero trust today. I, I think of passwords kind of like that saying about democracy, you know, they're the worst form of authentication except for all the other forms that have been tried. <laughs> That's a hundred percent right. And, and Scott and I were talking about that and we kind of figured, well, if we can't beat them, we can at least get together and complain about them. So we asked our coworkers here at Actual Tech Media to submit their top password gripes, the things that drive them nuts. 
and uh, and kind of consolidated that list into a few key pet peeves that we're going to explore with you here today. Now, before we jump in, we also want to hear from you. So we want to know what are your top password pet peeves. So post them in that chat that we talked about earlier. Post them in the live chat. Let us know what drives you nuts. This is a safe space here. Cone of silence. We won't tell anyone. Just let us know what are your top password pet peeves. All right. So Scott, I'm going to kick the first pet peeve to you. And that is dun, 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 biometrics. Now I mentioned earlier that sometimes my face doesn't always read in the morning. Rude. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk about this gripe, Scott. Talk to us about thumbprints and facial scans. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so this is authentication more broadly than passwords, but, you know, and it's the biometric kind. But, you know, when the thumbprint reader doesn't work, you know, this is especially a problem when you've protected your device with something like an OtterBox. You know, the first few months, it's great. You know, you're cleaning it regularly. You can get a few more months out of it. But then it becomes sort of a crapshoot. And, you know, we all take our cues from, you know, movies as far as, you know, how to behave with our tech. You know, and I think of like, say Mission Impossible and, and, and Tom Cruise. And I can't imagine him like mashing his thumb at various different angles on his thumbprint and finally giving up, you know, and putting in the code. He would be shot, he'd be dead, um, you know, but, uh, you know, so so you can't tell me that that guy also doesn't need an otter bark because his phone wouldn't last two hours, uh, with the kind of abuse that, you know, he, he takes in those movies. Um, you know, so so that's one of my major annoyances is just trying to get my my thumbprint recognized. Yeah, and I mean, I am no secret agent, but I'm a rock climber in my in my spare time, and my even my uh, fingerprints just from the the roughness uh, sometimes don't read, and and that's very annoying. So apparently, I have no biometric presence at all. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> you're a ghost. I'm a ghost. <laughs> all right, let's well let's move on to another. Uh, pet peeve. How about uh, forced password expiry? Oh, yeah. Okay. Forced password expiries. I mean, I get it. I understand why these came into place. And I also totally understand why they're on a pet peeve list. So here's the thing. At the end of the day, when we're talking about this kind of, you know, passwords and security, we're dealing with that always confusing, somewhat unpredictable human element. You know, we did a tech talk uh, about a week or so ago on Zero Trust. It, if you haven't watched it yet, go check it out. It's awesome uh, on the actual Tech Media YouTube channel. And one of the things that the speaker really dug into was that the biggest risk to security is people. So basically, all of us, we are the weak point in the army armor here. So on the one hand, the argument for forced expiry seems to be, well, we know people and human behavior can be a security risk. So let's put some nice guardrails around team members and try to keep their data as protected as possible by forcing them to renew these passwords. But the counter argument to that seems to be, yeah, okay, but I'm a human and I'm bad at creating and remembering secure passwords. So have we really solved anything by forcing me to repeatedly do this thing that I'm bad at every few weeks? I mean, maybe not. So that might be something to think about at your organization. And let's move on to our next pet peeve here. Scott, I want to talk about strong passwords and the many ways that this is a gripe for people because Scott and I were kind of interested. We heard some gripes from our coworkers that were not exactly the gripes that we expected about this. Do you want to dig into that a little bit, Scott? Yeah, so you know, this is a website problem. When you're using a password manager and you paste that password suggestion from the manager, sometimes the site will reject it for being too complex for the site's password rules. So they're forcing you to dumb down your password and make it more crackable, essentially. You know, and mostly complaints about complexity come from the other way where, you know, they keep getting rejected by the site because the password isn't complex enough, but it happens both ways. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, last one, Jess, tell us about password overload. <laughs> Okay, so everybody in the audience can relate to this, I'm sure. I think everything we do now is password protected. And that's great because security is important, but it's this security and convenience kind of balance that just never really seems to be, well, balanced for me. And I end up having, 
you know, all my devices and I'll have like certain logins saved on certain devices. So like I can only check into my, you know, taxes or, or healthcare information on my personal laptop. Work stuff has work. My phone has different things. I, if I want to get movie tickets, I have to log into an account that I only have the password saved on my phone. And so I can't do it from my computer. I don't want to reset my Disney plus and my Netflix on one device. And I reset, I mean, it's a nightmare. And I don't have a solution for this at all. This is just me complaining. Uh, I don't know, Scott, what, do, what do, do you think maybe we'll get some solutions today? I do. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, is interesting is that passwords have been around for a long time. It's, you know, it's a mature market, but there's still a ton of room for, you know, innovation and, and sort of elegance in solutions. And we're going to hear about some of those today. All right. Well, I think that is a good note to end on. A little bit of hope, a little bit of light at the end of this dark password pet peeve tunnel. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, joining us and playing this game with us today. Uh, I'm very excited to learn about some solutions. Thanks to the Actual Tech Media team for submitting all of these gripes and pet peeves. Uh, and Scott, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Thanks. All right. Sorry, I have to get my mic back on here. Uh, well, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you to everyone who submitted all of their pet peeves. I love seeing those coming in. We got some really good ones. I think a lot of your pet peeves are the same ones that, that we're kind of seeing uh, here at Actual Tech Media. I think those are just human feelings. And, and as Scott said, uh, I think we're about to get some really great solutions. So now before we dive in, I have, I have a test, another test to see how awake you all are. Uh, so we have a, a poll question up here on the screen and we're just curious, we'd like to get to know you guys a little bit better and, and how you describe your role in your organization. So we're talking high level here, you know, not, not necessarily the nitty gritty, um, but if somebody asks you, what do you do? Do you say that you work in tech or do you say that you work in IT? Um, and, and just kind of curious about this one. If it's neither or you wouldn't say tech or IT, let us know what it, what it is, uh, and you can fill that out in the question tab. We would definitely love to hear that. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a second to fill that out. Quick, 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 like bunnies. Okay, awesome. And because you guys did so well, I have a second question for you. Ah, the fun just keeps continuing this morning. We're a little curious about your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company. So if you're here today, you're clearly interested in passwords, authentications, identity, you know, what, what uh, time frame would you be looking to make some improvements or, or innovations or to, to throw out everything and start completely from scratch? Uh, what, how, how long are you guys thinking? You know, weeks, months, years? Uh, and just let us know kind of where you're at there. So I'm looking at the results coming in and I'm seeing actually a really good, this is one of the more even uh, responses that I've seen from everybody, which is pretty cool. Uh, it shows that I think a lot of us are in different phases and, and different levels of urgency. Uh, and the good news is that there's going to be answers for everyone today. So, <laughs> all right, well, thank you to everyone who filled out those polls for us. And I'm going to move forward in our presentation because up next, we have a very exciting presenter here with us, Aubrey Turner, Executive Advisor at Ping Identity. Aubrey, thank you so much for joining us today. I know our audience is just pumped and ready to get started. You're our first presenter in the EcoCast today. So I'm going to hand things right over to you. Take it away, Aubrey. Hello there, and welcome to my session, Going Passwordless with Risk Signals. My name is Aubrey Turner, and I lead the executive advisor practice at Ping Identity. It's really a uh, privilege, uh, pleasure to cover a topic kind of 18 years in the making, so to speak. And what I mean by that is uh, it was 2004 when Bill Gates announced the death of the password. And clearly, it's uh, almost two decades in, we are still working on this problem and this this challenge and certainly um password authenticate passwordless authentication certainly has its you know received its share of the, the limelight so to speak uh, there's a lot of promise of uh, enhancing security driving productivity building these frictionless user experiences however the path and the journey to passwordless often leads to more questions and answers so in this session i will 
shed some, shed some light on you know, why we need to move from passwords. I will talk about what that journey could look like, what a roadmap looks like. And as I mentioned, how we can leverage risk signals is one of the options. And you need all the options uh, in terms of being able to go passwordless. So one of the options that we can use in order to deliver these passwordless experiences and uh, really bring about more frictionless experiences. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, we all know, and this is nothing here that you know is rock is is uh, breaking news, but <clears throat> passwords not not are not secure. And let me share a couple, a handful of stats with you. Eighty percent of breaches, brute force attacks, uh, are related to stolen credentials, and uh, we, uh, as you know, individuals and employees and consumers, on average, have about one hundred ninety-one different user ID and passwords. Um, you know, if any any of you are remembering all of those, uh, more power to you. That's that's impressive. And then seventy percent of us reuse passwords across sites, so we're just creatures of habit, and, and in some cases, lazy. So those stats kind of say say quite a bit about how passwords can't can't and don't scale for uh, how we interact with applications and how we are as you know employees and consumers. They just don't scale for uh, the world of today and. and you know, probably more than likely when they were introduced, you know, 60 or so years ago, I forget now the date of the birth of the password. As soon as somebody introduced one, somebody probably brute forced it or compromised it, which brings me to that chart on the left there, which is interesting in that uh, it really speaks to the number of characters uh, and how long it takes to brute force your password in 2022. I think I can make the argument there's really no such thing as a strong uh, or complex password particularly in light of phishing and, and key loggers. Somebody's, um, you know, fished you and, and got a key logger, they're basically logging in as you. So strong and complex passwords are not going to save you there. So again, that's really the, the, the backdrop here um, relative to passwords not being secure. We all know that. They're also very, very frustrating. This is an actual uh, website here. Mommy has a potty mouth. And then, you know, lots of reactions, 122 reactions, 42 shares. Um, we don't want these comments about our digital experiences, but they're unavoidable from a password perspective, right? Uh, you know, Kevin Vale, that's when I pound on the keyboard. I think, you know, Dawn is saying all the time, you know, why can't I remember passwords, but I know all the lyrics to the music from the 90s. Uh, you, you get the idea, right? They're very, very frustrating, uh, bad experiences. And, and, and really, again, this is kind of like a, I, I did a podcast yesterday and we, kind of related passwords to, to junk food, right? They are, you know, uh, it's it's inexpensive, you know, um, easy to use or easy to, to consume, but we know there are downsides, we know there are consequences. And and in some cases, um, you know, the, the experience isn't, isn't, uh, isn't always a, a really good one. So, uh, you know, that brings us to why are we still using them? And there are a handful of reasons why. So I'll share those with, with you now, but it's kind of like we're treating the symptom and not the root cause, right? So we keep saying, hey, we need complex passwords policies and all those things. And, and obviously those things aren't working, but there are three, three reasons. One, the, the compatibility and technical debt um, concerns. And certainly, you know, over that 18 years that I mentioned, the, the, the technology is caught up with the hype of kill the password. But you know, the human factor, fear, uncertainty, uh, you know, kind of move who moved our cheese kind of thing. I think people are so used to passwords and they see them as they're comfortable with them as the, the security between that's protecting their assets and health records and financial uh, records, et cetera, et cetera. So they're comfortable with them. So when you say passwordless, they may mean, or may, they may think that means less security. And then last but not least, uh, in, from a consumer, or even in really from a workforce perspective, there are lots of different use cases and scenarios that you need to, to contemplate. You may have people that are in front of a lap, laptop or desktop, and they may have a, a biometric reader or device on them, that device. But what about uh, your, your colleagues that may be, you know, they may be wearing protective gear, eye gear, um, you know, gloves, uh, you get the idea, right? So organizations have many, many user scenarios and we need various options in order to deliver these passwords experiences. And so those become obstacles to, those become ob obstacles to why we are still, still using passwords. 
So that brings us to why we should eliminate them. <clears throat> Certainly security, right? We know some of the obvious things I've touched on those, credential stuffing, uh, account takeover, the, the bad experience, mommy has a potty mouth. We, we all know the, 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 the concerns there. Uh, I touched on complex password policies and why that may not even matter. And then cost, uh, that's a big one, 70% or sorry, excuse me, $70 for a reset from our friends at Forrester. So uh, a lot of money being spent uh, on password resets and you know we're spending a lot of money on password resets uh we're leveraging passwords and again they're they're cheap and easy to implement kind of like that that junk food kind of thing they're they're, they're quick and fast uh but uh you know easy uh, but then they're downsides and they they are negative consequences and negative outcomes so you know <clears throat> you know after 18 years we're, we're still talking about it's time to go passwordless and it's, you know, uh, more than ever, it, it really is a, a good time to do so, given some of the factors that I have touched on, including that customers are warming up to passwords. 46% of us prefer sites that offer password alternatives. 53% of uh, consumers feel better when using MFA to log into sites. And so as I'm, you know, reducing password usage, that's a delight and, and, that, that will delight and, and make, make consumers and customers feel better that you are protecting them. And those things aren't mutually exclusive anymore, right? You've got to uh, deliver a good experience while also securing uh, the customer information. And those are, uh, again, like I said, uh, those, th those two things, customers expect both. Bouncing back to some of the costs and, and how passwords are costly for organization. And it's kind of like the hidden cost of like junk food, again, it, tastes really good. And then uh, sometime later, uh, you know, there's, there's a, you've got to pay for it. And so 11 hours of lost uh, annually from password resets, 12 minutes spent weekly entering and resetting passwords, and then 5.2 million in productivity cost loss. So there is, you know, there is cost associated with passwords. Uh, we've only got two, roughly the average person has about 2.5 billion seconds in their average lifespan. And we're wasting a lot of it or, uh, too much of it, I'll say, on dealing with passwords. And again, there isn't, you know, we're spending a lot of time dealing with them and not having a really positive outcome in, in terms of breaches and those kind of things. The value of passwordless on the work first side certainly increased productivity, reducing those help desk calls, and then mitigating phishing and, and really better security. On the SIAM side, reducing customer churn, meaning folks that won't, uh, you know, abandon a transaction because uh, they find your competitor easier to do business with. Uh, and, you know, people don't remember their passwords, they can't find their notepad, uh, or they don't want to use a password manager. So reducing abandonment, reducing churn, um, building, you know, increased customer lifetime value, and certainly using biometric methods that are familiar to customers. So think about any, you know, your smartphone, uh, touch your, your facial recognition, or some kind of biometric scan, we're all getting more comfortable with those kind of things. And then eliminating password replay risk and those kind of account takeover scenarios. So lots of value on both sides, uh, in terms of it's time to go passwordless. Uh, hold on, though. And let me take a step back, I'm talking about sort of all the sort of the pros and cons and kind of why we should but and as i mentioned at the beginning you know sometimes passwordless and how to go passwordless raises more questions and answers so why don't i define passwordless authentication for you and really it's it's fairly simple any method of verifying the identity of a user that does not require to provide a password and there are two goals associated with that using fewer passwords and then getting rid of passwords completely and I'll acknowledge in the sense of true password, yes, we wanna get rid of passwords. However, due to some of those aforementioned obstacles, we gotta leverage different tools. And this is where this risk piece will come up here very shortly that can allow us to use passwords fewer and still deliver those experiences, those passwordless experiences, those frictionless experiences that we are looking for. So something that uh, you know reduces and allows you to use fewer passwords, that counts as passwordless password less, less until again, things align, align between uh, the human factor, the technical factor and the use case factor where you can leapfrog and deliver true password less uh, in those user scenarios. So what does that journey look like? 
really starting with centralized authentication, think about single sign-on, beginning to phase out passwords. I'll get into each of those, each of these a little bit more here in a second. Uh, leading into FIDO, which has become the de facto standard for passwordless. And really, really cool. There's been a lot of activity in the last uh, six months uh, around passwordless. And one of the really cool things I, I think is uh, the big three, Apple, Google, and Microsoft agreeing uh, or really acknowledging their support for FIDO. So that's a really positive sign in terms of standards and interoperability. Uh, but stand, again, FIDO and then true passwordless, which is, uh, you know, there are going to be some cases where you might be able to leapfrog uh, to FIDO and or true passwordless uh, use cases given the right scenario. So a little bit more detail in each of these. So that centralized adaptive authentication, really known as SSO, we can extend sessions based on time-based policies uh, or leverage policy-based authentication that, you know, login is triggered when, a, when there's a, a risk score, right? Uh, so a high risk score, maybe we're asking for additional login. Um, phasing out passwords and what password lists could look like, a username plus MFA. So authenticate uh, with a user, type in a username and then use device biometrics, some type of authenticator. Uh, magic links, uh, really, really good from a consumer perspective. You authenticate via magic link sent to an email. And most of us have had email accounts for some time. I've had uh, you know, an email account for 15 years. It's tied to me, same thing with my mobile number. And then you may have a similar experience. Uh, and then QR codes. This is like if you've ever you know, bought a TV recently or gone to a hotel room and you're logging into a streaming service and a QR code pops up instead of having to type in that username and complex password you know, one at a time, you guys know what I'm talking about there. So QR code is another way that we can, uh, on a trusted device, uh, log into uh, trusted device, trusted app, uh, log into uh, an application or service in a really, really easy manner. Touched on FIDO, built-in uh, device biometrics, such as on a smartphone uh, or even a uh, security key, for example. So these keys are paired with apps and, and paired with other services and allow you to access these things in a passwordless manner. And in the FIDO instance, those credentials, they're the, the, they aren't server-side credentials, so the server isn't going across the wire. So it mitigates phishing, which is really, really a strong benefit of FIDO and why it's become that de facto standard for passwordless. And then sort of that quote unquote true passwordless. Here we're doing an identity proofing event, uh, establishing device trust, which is really about a chain of, of trust there. Uh, typically PKI or PKI uh, involved in that, uh, in that establishment of trust and no passwords ever. So in that scenario, there isn't a password and you know it's, it's really true, true passwordless. In these other scenarios, there may be a password in the background, the user may or may not know that it exists. It could be a fallback uh, method, um, but this is the, what the passwordless journey could look like. As I mentioned, you may be using and you likely will use all or a combination of these to deliver on passwordless experiences for your employees and or workforce. And it's okay to leverage them. And, and one of the things that I'm gonna talk about here now is how risk signals can be a tool that you leverage to deliver passwordless experiences and and move you along this passwordless journey and help with uh, some of the answers to some of those questions that you may be asking. So um, risk signals uh, and what they really do, they're analyzing contextual information to determine whether to step up uh, the authentication or whether to sort of let the user sort of go on their way. So think about, you know, whether it's a speed bump or a stop sign um, or maybe just a yield kind of scenario if the traffic analogy kind of works. But there's two real benefits here. Risk signals, they bolster security, but they also um, provide and can enhance the user experience. So that's the, that's the idea uh, behind risk signals. And so the problems that they're solving, uh, they can certainly support you know, work from home scenarios and, and that's exploded as part of digital transformation, digital first users and consumers. So we see risk as being foundational and then a key component of passwordless. And really the rule in human policies can't keep up with the threats, the threat landscape because of all the things that have happened and continue to happen over the past couple of years and going forward. There are really new challenges relative to monitoring and securing uh, remote workforces and, and certainly from a consumer perspective. And so um, lots of challenges there and, and uh, risk signals certainly uh, are a tool that can help us solve some of those challenges. Additionally, um, authentication, single sign-on plus MFA plus risk makes that whole 
Uh, that three-legged stool makes that whole entire process smarter. And if we talk about zero trust for a minute and SSO everything and MFA everywhere, that MFA everywhere piece brings and could introduce and likely will introduce a lot of fatigue. Guess what? Risk signals can help to reduce that MFA fatigue um, by understanding patterns and understanding, uh, you know, normal behavior from, again, something where, you know, there's an indicator of, of compromise or indicator or risk indicator tr is triggered and you may, you know, want to prompt for MFA, but if you don't need to, then you can, again, let that user sort of go on, go on their way. And this can be certainly used from an employee and or customer's perspective, really talking about unknown to known and making that journey as frictionless as possible. Uh, so being able to monitor, verify, you know, authenticate, authorize, uh, and that's underpinned by uh, the ability to look at risk signals. So optimizing this um, identity security in this journey, uh, leveraging the an intelligent risk engine that's uh, continuously monitoring these signals. We can aggregate, you know, multiple signal sources um, to determine whether um, a to determine whether uh, an authentication event is high risk or low risk. So some of those signals that we're looking at: device posture. Uh, the using machine learning and artificial intelligence, impossible travel, IP reputation, uh, other, uh, as I said, other um, custom and third party risk feeds, again, that we can aggregate those signals um, to make a, a better decision about um, the, the user journey. So really uh, taking authentication from where it was being very binary, yes, no, to um, making it like, as I said, more intelligent, making it smarter, making smarter authentication decisions. If you have more data um, or the ability to look at uh, more contextual data, then you can enhance that journey, make more intelligent choices. So as that person tries to authenticate, that risk engine is processing and looking at those contextual pieces of information. And as I said, they can deny so kind of that stop sign, um, they can approve or let you go, let you kind of continue on your way or risky kind of that speed bump scenario where, hey, I'm gonna ask you to, to uh, re-verify your identity uh, through another, another means, typically MFA, right? And so being smarter, more intelligent uh, about uh, authentication uh, and really, back to the, the title of this session, delivering <clears throat> a more passwordless, uh, delivering a passwordless experience, leveraging risk signals. And one of the options that you can uh, use to deliver this type of passwordless experience to um, your workforce, as well as your customers. So with that, I wanna thank you for listening to my session. As always, I encourage you to reach out to your uh, ping rep, uh, certainly myself, myself for more information uh, to learn more about uh, not only uh, going passwordless with risk signals, but the other capabilities that can help you go passwordless and certainly the, the entire um, ping um, product line and our offerings uh, in terms of the um, securing the digital customer journey. Uh, as I said, Thanks again. Don't hesitate to reach out, um, even if it's just uh, for a conversation or maybe even a, uh, a no obligation trial. We'd love to hear from you. With that, thanks and take care. Be well. Well, thank you, Aubrey, for joining us today. What an interesting presentation. A great way to kick off our EcoCast. I'm, I still, I, I don't know if I can really believe that I'm spending 11 hours a year resetting passwords. That's wild, Aubrey. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. The math cell. Yeah. I, math I was writing some of those stats down and thinking, I, I got to think about this. I want those 11 hours back. <laughs> of course. <laughs> we all want them back. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, luckily, you're here, uh, and I can see that we've got a lot of great questions coming in for you. I do want to point out that I have put up a, a poll question for you all. We would love to get your feedback on any additional resources that you would like to explore from Ping Identity. There was, as I said, just really interesting questions and, and lots of uh, cool statistics and uh, interesting things in this presentation. So you know, if you'd like to follow up with Ping Identity, this is a great way to let them know how exactly they can reach out to you, what you want to hear, um, and, and what more information you'd like. I am sure that there is lots. Um, Aubrey, you're also getting some, some high fives. Peter just sent you some applause over the live chat. So. <laughs> Love it. And uh, Love it. James and Neil are also saying thanks. So lots of, lots of fans in the audience. Uh, well, you ready to jump into some questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, awesome. Um, I did actually, I wanted to start with this one just in case anyone else uh, had the same question. We, we did get asked about, you used the term MFA fatigue. Um, can you just give a quick sort of level set on, on what you mean by that? Uh, MFA as, what was that last part? Fatigue. Oh, MFA fatigue. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if you think about uh, zero trust strategy, for example, right? And if whatever, however you feel about zero trust, whatever it means to you, some of the principles are, SSO everything and MFA everywhere, right? So if you put MFA everywhere as part of that zero trust strategy, that normally, that, that naturally brings about fatigue where every time you're trying to access something, you have to do some kind of, uh, there's some kind of MFA prompt right now. It could be, um, you know, you push something, you do uh, fingerprint or facial recognition, uh, but that's what I mean by MFA fatigue. And something else that's also now happening that is, Sort of also playing a role into this is what we call prompt bombing. And this is where a bad actor huh. will just prompt somebody for MFA until human nature, we just push the button. So there's, you know, there's some consequences of, well, as with everything, right? There's pros and cons. And that's what I mean when I say MFA fatigue. It just becomes a, it just becomes, a, you know, something good or well-intentioned has a downside. And that's, that's what uh, that that references. That helps. Boy, that yeah, that fatigue is is so dangerous. I was just this morning looking. I got an email from uh, DoorDash, and I was like, ah, oh, and I went to go unsubscribe. And before I hit unsubscribe, I remembered hearing that there, there's some phishing where they're they're ma making the unsubscribe button is the <laughs> is the problem area. Um, and I thought, you know what, I should just look and see who this is from before I click on anything, you know. And it, but it's just in that second, I was running from thing to thing, and and I almost clicked on something. Now it was fine. It, it was not a phishing scam, but like, but it's this constant vigilance that's just exhausting. It, it it really is, and and certainly bad actors, right? They they know that, and they're exploiting, uh, you know, they're exploiting human nature, right? And that's a that's the whole yeah. engineering and all all of those things. Uh, they know that you know human frailty, laziness, whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> we're instinctively maybe just going to push that button without. And and you're, I love how you put that. That there's um being constantly vigilant, like you're on high alert all the time, and it's just it's fatiguing. So. Um, sometimes we make, we make mistakes and they can be costly. Mm. So, um, you know, all kinds of things that we got to pay attention to. <clears throat> well, um, on that note, we did have somebody asking uh, about, so, you know, you, you can do all the training you want and work with your employees, but what if you're a company that has um, external, you know, either contractors or, or vendors or, or seasonal employees, so you have people that have access into your system uh, either temporarily or in short-term doses, and, and what would you recommend uh, in those cases? Yeah, so one of the things that we're seeing uh, as a use case, and this is just a uh, sort of a natural, again, um, outcome of sort of us becoming digital first users and consumers, right? So the pandemic naturally uh, drove a lot of this. Um, and it all depends on your risk tolerance. I'll preface what I'm about to say with that, right? Um, all depends on your risk appetite, your risk tolerance, what those external users have access to, um, what your supply chain assurance models look like. All of those things factor in. So I'll preface what I'm about to say with that. But uh, potentially, if you have a contractor that has, again, similar access to a privileged user, you may want to do some kind of identity verification. And there's various levels to that. Um, but think along the lines of some kind of uh, facial, you know, recognition scan and comparing that to uh, a state or federal issued um, document, such as a driver's license or passport, 
really to answer two questions. Is this a real person? And are they who they're claiming to be? So we're seeing it, um, interest in those kind of solutions for contractors and vendors and, and what access they have. And certainly passwordless is something that, you know, can be applied to those contractors and, and vendors, third, third parties. Again, it just depends on the relationship that you have with them, um, which path you want to have them go down, right? Um, but mm. uh, identity verification paired with multi-factor authentication, eventually passwordless, uh, are some of the things that I, I would suggest. And certainly, certainly leveraging some kind of um, privilege access management solution that basically controls the workflow if that third party has access to privilege accounts you know when they're accessing those accounts and only grant them access for a, a time box period of time, right? So those are the controls that I would suggest um, people kind of consider. And then also, last thing is, you know, you've got to think about account recovery. So if they lose those credentials or forget them, how are you going to ensure that it is the right person um, that is trying to recover the account? Here again, something like identity verification, identity proof in, and come into play and, and give you the right level of assurance and confidence that that third party or, or contractor is who they're stated are, right? Uh, but again, all based on risk, appetite, risk tolerance, and you gotta know um, the level of controls that you need to make sure that person is who they're claiming to be. Those are my quick quick thoughts on that. <laughs> Those are great thoughts. Um, Aubrey, I can't tell you how much I would like to continue this conversation and I, I wish we weren't on a time crunch today. Um, Our time's I have up already. To wrap it. Oh, I know we've already <laughs> we've already we were just getting rolling. Aubrey, you need to come yeah. back. We have to do a full webinar with you, my friend. This is this is way uh, too much to. to cover. <laughs> uh, well, and clearly the audience would like to have you back as well. We got a couple other high fives for you. I don't know if you have some time to stick around over live chat, but there's a lot of questions in there for you. Uh, and okay. we will make sure that we get all of the questions to you. So uh, Ping Identity will have the opportunity to respond. So if you did ask a question and we didn't get to it, you will get an answer. Before you run away from us, Aubrey, if somebody is really excited to get started, you mentioned you know, reaching out to the, the reps, getting in touch. You know, what, What's the first step uh, towards getting involved with Ping Identity? and maybe making some of these decisions that, uh, that are on people's plates right now? Yeah, I think just reaching out to us, right? Um, certainly, there's, there's ways to, to get in touch with Ping via our website. Uh, certainly, you know, um, contacting me via this channel, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, in this circumstance, if I get bomb bombarded, it, you know, I've got to find a way to <laughs> kind of share, share that, that wealth of, of uh, ask, but yeah, I, I encourage your, our listeners, and thank you for listening. Thank you for the high fives. Encourage you guys to reach out. Um, encourage us to start the conversation. Um, this password list is, um, and again, it's cliche what I'm about to say, but it is absolutely true. Um, it is a journey, not a destination. So um, mm. if you want to get started, uh, let's start the conversation. So I'll leave it there. And say mm. thanks. I again. love that. That's a great place to leave it. <laughs> uh, well, Aubrey, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise. Take care. All right, folks. Well, again, thank you to everyone who answered our poll and submitted a question. Uh, that really does, you know, bring these these conversations to life when we get your wonderful questions. And I, and again, do want to remind you that you will get answers. I know we missed, uh, didn't get to a lot of questions here, so we'll make sure that you get answers. Uh, I am going to, however, as a trade-off. Now I know we had to wrap up an interesting conversation, but the good news is we have a prize giveaway. So <laughs> there's, a, there's some light there. Uh, we have the first of our three $500 Amazon on gift cards that we'll be giving away. Again, we have three lucky winners uh, receiving those today. I'm pretty pumped up about this. I hope you are. So our first winner, uh, and I'm going to remind you, sorry, one more time, you do need to be here live with us at the webinar today. Our very first winner of a $500 Amazon gift card today is Sean Stebner of Oregon. Sean Stebner of Oregon, you have won a $500 Amazon gift card. Congratulations to Sean. Don't forget that there's still lots more chances to win a prize today. Plus, 
we have that best question gift card from each session. And I can tell you the competition is fierce today. We've got some great questions, but keep those coming in. All right. Well, uh, next up in our EcoCast today, I am so excited to introduce McCullough Hingey, Group Product Marketing Manager, Security at Okta. McCullough, thank you so much for joining us on the EcoCast today. Now, I know that you have a ton of great information to cover, so I am going to hand the mic right over to you. Hi, and welcome to this webinar on passwordless authentication with Okta. I'm Mukul Hinge, a group product marketing manager at Okta, and I focus on the security aspect of Okta's workforce identity solutions. In the next 30 minutes or so, I'd love to take you through some problems with using passwords for authentication and illustrate how Okta can help organizations who face these very same issues. But first, as always, Okta needs to share the safe harbor, which is required simply to remind any customers, partners, and any other external audience that these are all forward-looking statements and should not be considered commitments to deliver. Okay, now let's take a look at the agenda. So in this webinar, we are going to start with the driving need for passwordless authentication, and then move on to an overview of Okta's passwordless solutions. Uh, we'll also go through a brief demo of Okta FastPass, which is our device-based passwordless solution. And then uh, we'll have hopefully some time for Q&A and uh, wrap up. So with that, let's hop right in. Authentication. Proving that we are who we claim to be has always been an interesting challenge for humans. And uh, it was the Romans who were the first to use a password-like system. They had uh, something called watchwords as a form of identification. So halt who goes there. And uh, that, uh, then the watchword was shared. And interestingly, these watchwords shared a lot of common characteristics with uh, today's uh, 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 modern passwords, you might say, such as having a second secure channel. And uh, this basic concept later evolved through the Second World War, uh, where the US Army used the idea of a sign and a countersign uh, to validate uh, on the battlefield. But uh, it was in the 1960s at MIT uh, that the first computer-based password system was implemented uh, in uh, a primitive form, uh, but very similar uh, to the one that we have today. And uh, this later uh, evolved into the system that we actually use today uh, for password-based authentication. And today, of course, we live in a world full of password sprawl, where we are constantly creating new accounts and uh, using passwords and reusing them. And uh, this over-reliance on passwords is actually proving to be a bit of a problem. Yes, how big is this problem? Well, here are some figures illustrating the severity of it. So 80% of all web application-based data breaches uh, resulted from compromised credentials, according to Verizon's data breaches investigation report last year, uh, this year, in fact. 40% uh, of all help desk calls uh, were from frustrated users who wanted to reset their password or recover it, and uh, productivity plummeted because of that. Organizations spent an average of $70 per password reset. Uh, so these figures demonstrate just how egregious the password-related problem really is. So one can't help but wonder, how did we end up with this mess in the first place? Well, to understand this, uh, let's take a look at how most modern authentication systems work today. So today, when you enter your username and password, uh, your credentials are sent over a secure transport layer uh, that hides or encrypts your credentials and sends them to a, a server, typically an authentication server, that compares these uh, to credentials previously stored in a database. And some form of matching occurs, and then they're either validated or invalidated. Now, straight off, you can see that this system has several flaws. Uh, flaws on the client side, where the user is entering the password, flaws on the server side, uh, so, for instance, uh, users might choose passwords that are very weak and easily guessed, such as password 12345, which happens to be one of the most common passwords, uh, by the way. And uh, uh, attackers could try brute forcing or guessing your passwords with password spray attacks, or they might even try attacks like uh, credential stuffing. So when a data breach happens, when your credentials are exposed, uh, then uh, uh, the uh, attackers go by the very, uh, very valid assumption that these credentials are likely to be reused somewhere else, so they'll try and stuff these credentials in other sites and uh, try and uh, uh, get access to those apps. Uh, so much so for weak passwords and uh, problems on the client side. What about the server side? Uh, well, firstly, the fact that the credentials are stored on the server itself is a bit of a problem because the way in which uh, these credentials are stored and handled can be uh, a vulnerability. Uh, so for instance, if uh, the passwords are stored in plain text, they could be easily exposed. Someone could download them and get a nice long list of credentials uh, ready for exploitation or uh, they could be uh, hashed and salted, encrypted, which is uh, a common method that's uh, used uh, very widely. Uh, trouble is that even uh, these encrypted or hashed passwords are vulnerable to something called rainbow table attacks. 
uh, which are based on reverse engineering the hashing algorithm used for encrypting those passwords. Uh, so trying to reverse engineer the hashing, uh, the hash itself and then the password and therefore get those credentials. Now, organizations, security researchers are well aware of these problems and they've tried to combat them by using a combination of authentication factors. So instead of relying on just one, uh, try and have a combination of factors, which you might commonly know as uh, multi-factor authentication, MFA. So these factors broadly include knowledge, which is something that you know, uh, like a password or a security question, uh, then possession, which is something that you have or you carry around, uh, like a smart card or maybe a key fob, or inheritance, uh, which is a fundamental attribute of who you are, a biometric attribute such as a fingerprint ID or a face ID. And using a combination of these factors, uh, organizations have tried to combat uh, these password uh, uh, theft issues. But uh, this, uh, the major problems that remain with these authentication mechanisms is that they're either over-reliant on knowledge-based authentication factors, uh, such as passwords, or uh, I use uh, second factors which are not uh, super secure, like SMS-based one-time passwords, uh, which are vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. And uh, uh, earlier I mentioned that uh, organizations uh, do use multi-factor authentication, but uh, they do so at the expense of the user experience, which can result in productivity drops. So having to wait for a one-time password, sometimes it's not sent uh, properly, you have to resend it, or having to carry around a smart card with you. Uh, if you forget it, uh, then you have to call into your help desk. Uh, so user productivity is affected. And uh, finally, all of these lead to high costs of help desk staffing. Now, someone has to be uh, managing and resetting all those passwords and handling those uh, support calls from the field. In fact, FedEx, one of our customers, shared an interesting insight based on the attacks that they see regularly. Compromised passwords are usually the first weak point that attackers target in the data breach kill chain. So food for thought. Okay, uh, so now that we've seen uh, what are some of the biggest problems with existing authentication mechanisms, uh, the question is, uh, what should an ideal authentication experience really look like, uh, both from the security viewpoint and the user experience viewpoint, and both from the viewpoint of the end user, as well as maybe a workforce administrator? Uh, well, firstly, it needs to have an exceptional user experience. Uh, users should be able to access resources uh, with minimal friction. Admin should be able to provision users with minimal friction, and so on. Secondly, uh, user experience should not come at the cost of security. Uh, so if strong security protections against ever-evolving attacks like credential stuffing or password spraying or all the attacks that I uh, alluded to earlier, uh, so they should be uh, uh, safeguards against those. Thirdly, uh, uh, such an authentication mechanism or solution needs to provide admins with controls and visibility to detect when something goes wrong. And ideally, it should do so with actionable alerts to limit the scope of the problem. Fourthly, as organizations grow, uh, the solution has to be easily scalable. There uh, shouldn't be scaling woes associated with it. And finally, it needs to be risk aware based on additional context and telemetry. So uh, for example, network location, user location, device location, uh, is the device still secure after the session was initiated or whether it was, uh, or has it been infected in the middle of the session, in which case the session should be terminated, for example. Uh, so uh, additional useful telemetry like that. Uh, so these are some of the attributes that go behind a good authentication mechanism, uh, according to us. Now that's a pretty long list, to be honest. And, so uh, how, how do we start checking off all those boxes? Well, uh, the very first step we feel is to fundamentally rethink our approach to authentication mechanisms. Uh, we saw earlier that the problem was an over-reliance on knowledge-based password, knowledge-based uh, systems such as passwords and uh, uh, security questions. And this needs to shift to possession and inheritance-based factors, uh, which include things like biometrics and multi-device field credentials and so on and so forth. And this shift to inheritance and possession uh, based factors is in fact a recommendation made by the FIDO Alliance, uh, which stands for Fast Identity Online. And uh, this is an open industry association with uh, major names like Apple and Google and Microsoft. And uh, the Alliance's stated mission is to help reduce the world's over-reliance on passwords. Okay, so uh, now that we've seen what uh, uh, the glimmerings of a solution look like, uh, let's take a look at uh, Octa's passwordless solutions and how uh, we can help organizations in their passwordless journey. Now, we understand that password-based authentication mechanism, uh, mechanisms are deeply entrenched and that uh, the move to passwordless is a bit of a journey rather than a simple plug and play solution. And therefore our vision for a passwordless future uh, involves offering a variety of solutions for organizations at different stages of uh, the passwordless maturity model, uh, so to say. Uh, so the available options that we have include uh, firstly Okta FastPass with Okta Verify, uh, the, uh, our authenticator app, uh, secondly, uh, support for secure factors such as WebAuthn or Fido2 and mobile authenticator apps that support uh, biometric authentication, for instance. 
email magic links uh, for organizations which wish to provide a one-time password uh, or a one-time link uh, for logging in. Uh, this could be applicable for apps that are infrequently accessed, for instance. And uh, these secure factors coupled with login context, uh, device type, location, network uh, location, uh, the client type, uh, whether it's updated or patched, and so on and so forth, uh, these allow admins to set policies to forego the requirement for a password, which can make the user experience absolutely seamless. So let's let's just take a look at each of these solutions in more detail and uh, see what they have to offer. So first off, we have Okta FastPass, which is our device-based password solution uh, that uh, works with the Okta Verify uh, Authenticate app available on all major app stores. And the process begins with uh, users registering their device to Okta using uh, the university directory. And after this one-time registration, Regardless of where the user is located, users have passwordless access to resources in Okta. The good thing about Okta FastPass is that you get a consistent user experience on desktop and mobile or on Windows or Mac OS or Android or iOS. Secondly, you get uh, painless integrations with management tools such as Microsoft Intune or AirWatch or Jamf. And uh, thirdly, you get a phenomenal support of integrations across the Okta identity network. There's no rip and replace required. Uh, we even offer on-prem web app support with the Okta ga uh, Access Gateway uh, for organizations that have a hybrid uh, sort of on-prem and uh, on, uh, uh, some uh, on-cloud model. Okay, moving on, Okta also supports passwordless authentication with WebAuthn, which is a new standard for passwordless auth. Uh, WebAuthn is basically a browser-based API uh, whose main advantage over password-based authentication is that it uh, uses public key cryptography and uh, allows web applications to use registered devices such as phones or laptops for authentication uh, instead of using passwords. And uh, the diagram on the right uh, shows sort of uh, how, how the flow works. Uh, so instead of uh, storing shared secrets in a database as uh, uh, password authentication mechanisms do, uh, WebAuthn uses an API that allows servers to register and authenticate users using two keys, uh, a public key and a private key. Uh, the private key is stored securely on the user's device and uh, the public key and a randomly generated credential ID is sent to uh, the, the authentication server for storage. The server can then use that public key to provide the user's identity and can use the biometric data uh, provided by the user at the time of authentication uh, for confirming whether the authentication is successful or not. And uh, to bring it all together, uh, Okta offers flexible policy options for organizations uh, that are in different stages, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so these include uh, time-based one-time passwords, for example, or uh, uh, there could be email-based authentication. And these options simplify user provisioning and authentication. So for instance, uh, if you take a look at the diagram on the left, now you have different uh, options uh, next to the password field. And with uh, password disabled, admins are no longer required to pre-enroll users with passwords. Uh, so these uh, save a lot of time uh, not having to specify passwords for users. Accounts can be activated without doing so. So that's that's the screen on the left, the policy screen. That is a list of supported authenticators. Uh, in the screen on the right, we can see a whole variety of verification options for users, such as uh, time-based one-time passwords or push notifications or Okta FastPass. Okay, so the big question, why Okta? And uh, what separates our solution for, uh, uh, really? Uh, well, firstly, uh, we like to think uh, for relentless focus on security as a differentiator. You can leverage uh, device and network context that provides enhanced security in terms of risk-aware logins. Uh, additionally, using device-level biometrics for trust is a big security measure, an added security measure. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, we feel that uh, uh, security shouldn't come at the expense of user experience, and uh, uh, there should be a friction-free experience, so no more wasted time, uh, no more wasted productivity with, with one-time passwords or forgotten passwords uh, with uh, uh, the shift to biometrics. And finally, your IT help desk is going to be grateful for the reduced volume of password reset calls, execs will appreciate cost savings for password reset related expenses. And that is what really separates Okta from the rest. Uh, but don't just take our word for it. Uh, today we have a huge customer base that's actively signing in without passwords and they're enjoying the added security and productivity benefits of our platform. Customers like Zoom, Rubrik and Intercom love the experience. And they say uh, that they, they've seen the use of passwords drop by anywhere between 50 to 70% on average. Now uh, that's, uh, that's pretty massive. And in the past 30 days alone, we've had over 3 million FastPass authentications. And this number has been growing exponentially. Okay, here's a chart that I'd love to share with our customers. At Okta, we dog food our products. And this chart on the right shows a comparison of Okta's passwordless solutions by popularity among Okta employees on the Okta platform. So as you can see, FastPass is the clear winner. It's, it's the authenticator of choice for most of our employees. 
followed by Webauthn, and then passwords. We, we like to see that figure drop to zero, to be honest. And we uh, also have uh, push notifications and time-based one-time passwords. Okay, so having covered all of these, now let's take a quick look at a demo for FastPass and how to deploy passwordless authentication with Okta. Okay, so in this demo, uh, we are going to give access to a user uh, to this dashboard, which is an Okta dashboard. And as you can see, the user already has some pre-provisioned apps like Google Docs and Atlassian, Adobe, Heroku, and so on and so forth. So uh, let's just start by opening up an incognito window uh, to see uh, what a typical login experience uh, with a multi-factor authentication policy uh, would look like uh, for such a user. Uh, this user has already been uh, pre-enrolled, uh, pre-activated, and now uh, this is what the login experience would look like. So when I try uh, to access my Okta dashboard, I enter my uh, username. At this stage, I'm prompted for uh, my password. So I'm going to enter that. Now uh, you see that this is the second factor of authentication that the administrator has set up uh, for uh, as part of the authentication policy, uh, which is Okta Verify. And uh, since I'm on a Mac OS, I'm going to use Touch ID to verify this. And now I'm able to sign into my Okta dashboard and see uh, my Okta uh, uh, apps that are available to me. Let's just close this window. So that's what a conventional login experience would look like. But now uh, let's go to my administrator console. And this is where I'm actually uh, setting and controlling all the policy options. So this is what the Okta dashboard looks like, uh, where I can get an overview of all my users and groups and SSO apps. Uh, operational uh, status, along with the number of agents that have been added, uh, security updates, et cetera, et cetera. Now, within this, I need to control access to the Okta dashboard. Uh, so I'm going to go to applications and I'm going to select the Okta dashboard because I want to uh, view the policy and edit uh, the policy details and the login experience for the user at this stage. So I click on view policy details and I see a catch all rule so you can see that the rule uh, basically says that access is allowed with password plus another factor, uh, which in this case was Okta Verify. So let's just edit this to try and make the experience a bit more uh, seamless for the end user. So I click on edit rule and then I scroll down to the conditions. So I'm going to leave all these options as they are. And here uh, the user must authenticate with, I'm going to change this from password plus another factor to a possession factor alone. And then by default, the hardware protection, uh, a hardware protected factor has been checked. Uh, so I can uh, check that. Uh, notice that there's also phishing resistance, which is something that we'll cover in the later session. Uh, so that can also be checked. For well, now, I'm going to leave that box unchecked. And I'm going to say that Okta, access with Okta FastPass is granted only if the user approves a prompt in Okta Verify or provides biometrics, uh, which, meets, uh, me, uh, which meets the standard NIST AL2 requirements. Okay, re-authentication frequency, I'm going to leave it at uh, two hours and save this. So now uh, let's just open up another incognito window and see the impact on the login experience. Okay, so as before, and you see that I've entered my username, but now it's not asking me for a password. I just verify my identity and here we go. I'm logged into the Okta dashboard just like that. And uh, something that I was doing on the uh, on the side while uh, we were looking at this demo uh, was timing this experience. Uh, so with uh, the multi-factor authentication policy enabled uh, with password and uh, another factor, uh, the login took me somewhere like uh, 30 to 40 seconds or around 40 seconds. And uh, I was able to shave off almost 70% uh, of the, uh, that time by getting rid of the password factor and requiring just the possession factor. Now that may not sound like a lot, uh, but over, over time is going to add up and it can add up to several hours on a yearly basis for each user. Uh, so uh, that's that's already uh, uh, a huge impact on productivity uh, from a user standpoint. And from a security standpoint, we've already covered some of the perks. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to stop the demo right here and jump right into our Q&A session. Uh, at this stage, we welcome any questions that you have around Octo's password solutions or around Octo FastPass or WebAuthn. 
Okay, so one question that I see is, can I use Okta FastPass without Okta Verify, the Okta uh, Verify app? Unfortunately, no, uh, the Okta Verify app is required for Okta FastPass. Okay, so follow-up question, uh, do end users have to update to the latest version of Okta Verify to use FastPass? Uh, that is correct. And the latest version of Okta Verify would be required and the end user must enroll or add an account in Okta Verify. Okay. Can face ID or fingerprint ID be used with Okta FastPass? Absolutely. Uh, so with Okta FastPass, you can basically use silent authentication, uh, which is uh, authentication without any user verification. Uh, so this would satisfy a one-factor authentication policy requirement, or uh, there could be silent authentication and user verification. Uh, so you know, there would be authentication happening, but uh, something like a face ID or a fingerprint scan to satisfy two-factor authentication. And Okta basically uses the term user verification to reference biometrics. Uh, user verification includes uh, things like facial recognition and fingerprint ID, as I mentioned. If that answers the question. Okay. Uh, okay, what happens, uh, this is a good question. What happens if biometrics is required with Okta FastPass? So that's it as a policy option, uh, but if it's not available on uh, the device. So sometimes you might be using an older device and biometrics might not be available. Uh, so if the device does not actually support biometric authentication and uh, the organization policy uh, requires uh, biometrics, uh, the user won't be able to add an account to Okta Verify or use Okta Verify for authentication on that particular device. Uh, they would need to switch to a device that, that does have biometric compatible uh, uh, authentication methods. Okay, so, Okay, follow up question on this. So basically, are you forcing your end users to use biometrics? Uh, well, not necessarily. So the point to remember is that user verification is a configurable option. So admins can set user verification to preferred or required. And that, that is what makes the distinction. So we uh, recommend that uh, user verification be set to preferred, uh, which will uh, only, uh, this is currently enforced only on enrollment. And uh, uh, so admins cannot really enforce user verification during authentication using Okta FastPass, if, if that clarifies things. Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, can I enforce push on Okta Verify if the end user doesn't provide biometrics? Uh, so uh, admins cannot specifically configure the policy to uh, specifically enforce push on Okta Verify, but uh, they can ask for a possession factor. And this factor can be satisfied with Okta Verify push. So for example, sending a one-time password to email, uh, Okta FastPass without user verif verification or SMS. Okay, what happens if I disable Okta FastPass? Oh, wow, lots of questions around FastPass. Uh, so when you disable Okta FastPass, the end users won't be able to log in with Okta FastPass, but they can still log in with other factors that satisfy assurance. So as, as configured by the policy. So uh, one thing that should be aware of, you should be aware of is that when you uh, check the Okta FastPass across all platforms checkbox uh, to disable it, uh, any authentication policy with a device condition can no longer be evaluated. So th that can result in unexpected behavior. So for disabling Okta FastPass, we'd recommend uh, reading the help guide to see uh, how it can be done properly now uh, without messing up your authentication policies. Uh, does Okta FastPass support UV keys? Uh, no, uh, so uh, Okta FastPass is an authentication method uh, like YubiKey. So YubiKey provides uh, additional compliance benefits at the cost of user experience. We think, I mean, you have to carry it around. Admins can choose to provide both FastPass and YubiKey, I guess. Uh, using for assurance policies, or you can require YubiKey only if you don't like FastPass. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so with that, uh, we would like to wrap up this webinar and thank you again for your time and patience today. Oh man, Michael, thank you so much for just an awesome presentation and for sticking around to answer some audience questions. We we obviously have lots of questions that we're not going to get to today, uh, but unfortunately we are out of time, so we are going to have to wrap it up there. Now I have actually uh, put up a question for all of you out there in the audience. We want to know what additional information you would like to get from Okta. So this feedback is incredibly important. Again, reaching out directly to the Okta team, letting them know uh, what you want to hear 
here. I did see some great high fives coming in. Uh, Macaulay, you should know you've got some fans and, uh, and customers in the audience, which is always great. Um, I'm loving the energy here today. Everyone's, uh, everyone's uh, giving a lot of great shout outs and high fives to our presenters, and that's just awesome. Uh, it means we've got a great crew of humans here and a great crew of solutions. Uh, so now if you are looking for more reading from Okta right away, head on over to that handouts tab. You can download Okta passwordless authentication, goodbye passwords, and identify driven attacks or identity driven attacks. Hello seamless experience. I love that <laughs> title. Uh, so go check that out. Learn more about creating a seamless experience. Again, it, you know, as, as Nicole just said, it comes down to that balance between uh, you know, experience and, and convenience, but not sacrificing security when we focus on that experience. So uh, again, thank you to everyone who submitted a question uh, and who has answered the poll. That is awesome to get that feedback in, and we really appreciate that. But it is time to keep rolling in our EcoCast here. Uh, we have come to a whole other awesome presentation I know you guys are going to be excited about. I'm giving you one last second to answer the poll. And we'll move on. Okay, so <laughs> up next, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our next presenter in today's EgoCast, Alex Hoffman, sales engineer at 1Password. Alex, thank you for joining us. Now, I know that our audience is very excited. I'm pretty stoked to hear more from you about what is up at 1Password. So uh, without any further ado here, the platform is all yours. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my presentation on the bliss that ignorance of passwords offers. I'm going to be talking about how having to deal as little as possible with passwords can reduce headaches for your team and make your business as a whole more secure. My agenda for the presentation looks like this. First, I'm going to be talking about the human elements of data breaches, then the tools you have at your disposal, and lastly, about creating a culture of security. In terms of introductions, my name is Alex Hoffman. I'm a sales engineer at 1Password. I've been part of 1Password since 2013 and have held many roles in the company over that time. Way back when, I led the customer support team for the Windows app, and later I was part of the original business development team. Let's get into it. Data breaches happen. Sometimes it's faulty code, unforeseen interactions between software, or human error in using a specific tool. What these have in common is that one or more people made a mistake that resulted in someone accessing systems or data they have no business in seeing. On average, a data breach costs a business about 4 million US dollars. That's no small amount. Yet bugs or exploited vulnerabilities in software are not the most common source of data breaches. As Johann Edmond puts it, weak, stolen, and leaked credentials are one of the biggest risks to business security today. Or in numbers, more than three-thirds of breaches have a weak or reused password as their root cause, meaning that the vulnerability attackers exploit the majority of times to gain access is the fact that people are bad at passwords. And really, that should come as a surprise to no one when research shows that 45% of US adults use passwords with eight characters or fewer, and that is not even looking at what those passwords look like. Chances are they're simple or have a personal connection. Now, the audience at this event may think, sure, the average user doesn't think about security the way a professional does, and it's hard to expect them to. But it's not just the average person behaving in an insecure way. Even people who know better reuse passwords or share them unsafely. And again, IT professionals, even people in IT security, DevOps, etc., are human. Even with increased awareness, they can fall into the same traps, the same kinds of insecure behaviors as everyone else. Only with them, the consequences of bad security hygiene are typically more severe. As for the causes of bad security hygiene, there are lots. From the most simple factor of convenience through time pressure to not having the appropriate tools to do something as easily and safely as it should be done. To give you a sense of the prevalence of this, According to our own research, 49% of workers admit to bending the security rules of their organization for the sake of productivity. Let that sink in. Nearly half the people we interviewed said that they knowingly bend or break rules to get stuff done. In other cases, it may also be a lack of awareness of process, procedures, and regulations. There are many more causes, obviously, so what can you do about it? Securing an organization is hard. But put into simple terms, 
An organization must try to reduce the chances of things going sideways by securing infrastructure technologically as best they can, handing their team meaningful tools to do their work in a secure manner without impeding them, and making sure that everyone knows how and why to work that way. I'm not going to go into securing infrastructure against unwelcome guests technologically because honestly, I don't know the first thing about it. So let's talk about a few of the tools you have at your disposal to help your team become ignorant of passwords to work more securely. The first group of products I want to highlight are there to enable humans to authenticate themselves with websites, services, software, and systems. I don't think anyone will begrudge me for putting password managers at the top because I'm obviously biased. My experience educating people and organizations about password security, supporting them in rolling out our products, and training teams has taught me that a password manager that puts a strong focus not just on raw security, but also a high quality end user experience, can remove major hurdles in getting a person to practice good security hygiene as consistently as possible. A password manager can be the centerpiece of a security strategy aimed at helping everyone in an organization to stop worrying about passwords. Yet realistically and frankly, ideally, a password manager is just one piece of the puzzle. Using a single sign-on solution that is tied to an identity provider makes managing access in a join or move or leave a context simple for an IT department and gets users closer to the kind of seamless experience they deserve. Information that ASSO isn't optimized for can go into a password manager that can either be tied into said solution or sit there independently as a separate secure bucket. And for logins and access keys where compromise would lead to catastrophic consequences quickly, privileged access management solutions can be the way to go, with features targeted at more advanced users and uses like on-demand checkout, multi-step request processes, and session reporting. Last but not least, viable implementations of passwordless systems are slowly gaining traction, relying on public-private key pairs for authentication, supplied by a centralized provider which reduce the attack surface even further for organizations and individuals alike. Another way to reduce password-related headaches for team members in an organization is to remove the need for a person to even see secrets in the first place when it comes to instructing machines or automated applications to do their work. Secrets management repositories for infrastructure secrets, continuous integration and continuous development environments, and programmatic access through the use of SDKs or API-based access help developers, IT ops, SecOps, and other departments work with references to API keys, SSH keys, signing keys, and other types of secrets, eliminating the bare necessity to know those secrets or transfer them from one place to another by hand. And the last group of tools I wanna to bring up are those an IT team can use to observe, guide, and understand how people work. Security information and event management, as well as log analytics products may seem boring on the surface, but when it comes to improving password security and management of secrets, they can be very useful. In the most traditional sense, these types of application enable IT and security teams to collect log information about usage and security events that have to be stored for controlling purposes and regulatory compliance. In the case of SIEM solutions, the usage spectrum is broadened to aid with real-time notification of events that may have security implications, like a large number of particularly sensitive data being accessed in quick succession. A SIEM solution can notify the appropriate team members to this behavior, who can then investigate. A third area of usage that is opened up by integrating these tools with a SSO provider and password manager is putting them in the service of internal teams and end users, uncovering patterns of available access and actual use of data to better shape data access distribution to expose team members only to the information and services they need. And then there's endpoint security software, which over the last decade or so has had it a bit rough. Operating system native anti-malware software has continuously gained ground and improved to a point where traditional antivirus and firewall products have become less relevant. Operating systems themselves have become harder attack targets and app stores and persistent sandboxing have led to threat patterns changing substantially. Where before machines and software were the most attractive point of attack, now it's the human sitting in front of the screen. That doesn't mean endpoint security software is completely without merit. On the contrary, a great term I've heard recently is light touch endpoint management. It's using endpoint security software less as a hard block and a point of potential employee surveillance and more 
of an approach to prevent egregious violations of company security, learn more about which applications and services people use and guide team members. Stepping out of this look at families of tools for a broader perspective, these are a few pieces of general advice when it comes to security tools. For any tool you consider, any security process you envision, the main goal should be to reduce friction to make it easier for your people to get their work done. Secondly, having everyone in your organization be subject to the same processes, expecting them to use the same security software, services, and directives will likely make a majority of people miserable, kill their productivity, and result in them engaging in unwanted behaviors just to be productive. Thirdly, no one tool can do it all. Trying to shoehorn one service to perform jobs not optimized or even built for is a waste of time and money. Understand what problem you're trying to solve, evaluate products carefully to understand what they do and what they don't do, and expect that you may have to broaden your search. And lastly, always keep in mind that software and service products aren't used in a vacuum. They are interdependent and have to serve their purpose in your organization's environment to merit their continued use. And with that, I want to move to the last part of this presentation to talk about a topic that I consider one of the most important and effective things an organization can do to improve their chances of not falling victim to attacks and breaches, creating a culture of security. I'll take a brief step back. Why should you care? You have a great suite of tools, you have technological enforcement in place, and you have clearly laid out processes that every team member has to confirm compliance with twice per year. They know what they're supposed to do. Well, a recent survey has shown that 91% of employees fully understand the risks of reusing passwords, yet 66% do it anyway. There are behaviors strictly enforced policies alone cannot fix. Looking beyond individuals and passwords, there are a number of areas of concern for HR, IT, and security. Shadow IT is undesirable in almost all cases, yet hard to control. When employees don't limit themselves to only the tools approved by the organization because they're looking to get things done, applications and services are put into use that are not covered in the approved and likely protected stack. So when data is scattered across multiple storage systems and locations, holes in security can be difficult to trace. If then one of these services suffers a breach, an organization may not know that it even affects them, leaving them powerless to remediate a breach in a timely way. Remote and hybrid work transitions are another new challenge for many companies and institutions. Despite the positive aspects of remote work, many security policies may have been relaxed while others haven't been adapted to the seismic transformation of working conditions. This can result in a failure to account for new threats associated with remote or hybrid work, which combined with shadow IT I mentioned a few moments ago, can be a powder keg of risk. And then there's modern development environments where every developer of our accounts and developers have to handle a greater number of secrets than ever before. Who can blame in-house dev teams for cutting corners to make a release date, like hard-coding secrets or other sensitive information into committed code intentionally or accidentally? So let's define a culture of security. A culture of security or a security culture refers to a prevailing attitude within an organization in which every team member of your organization sees good cybersecurity as a fundamental part of their job and a means to accomplishing their organization's mission. Beyond that, employees should feel empowered to make good and informed security decisions at all times and as part of their daily tasks. In a culture of security, no single organizational unit bears the entire burden of securing your organization that responsibility is shared, and it is the collective habits of employees that contribute to the ongoing protection of your organization's assets. Security culture thrives when habits shift and positive behavioral changes become a pattern across all departments. To quote Holly Hardage, successful security culture can only happen when every employee begins taking responsibility for protecting the organization. To do so, they must be confident in making security-minded decisions and their ability to recognize threats and issues. The benefits of having a strong security culture established in an organization are undeniable. Securing DevOps processes and streamlining development workflows, as well as lightening the load on IT and security by them having to deal with fewer issues is self-explanatory, I think. So I'll end this presentation talking about ways to make a team productive and secure. The idea is to enable a team to work in secure manners while not hampering productivity. The very first step 
is understanding that security is a secondary or even tertiary task for most people. It's something someone has to do before they can do their actual job. Providing people with easy to use tools, aiding them in completing those security tasks quickly is key. The next step is providing people with the right high quality tools appropriate for their jobs and having processes in place to reevaluate tool fit and offering an approachable process and contact points to request new services and applications so that they can go through proper evaluation and approval. But simply making a new application available to a team isn't enough. A tool is useless and potentially dangerous if not used correctly. You need to offer training and avenues for feedback. Taking this last point further, in order to embrace security processes and tools, team members have to gain understanding of unsecure actions and their consequences, learn how to act securely and responsibly, and do not forget to tell them the why behind it. That will go a long way to people not only accepting, but internalizing security culture. And lastly, encourage your team to take the lessons they've learned back home. With 1Password Business, every team member gets a free 1Password Families account for private life use, and I know that most other password managers have similar offers. This is not a gimmick, but something that has provable security benefits. When people are shown that security tools aren't just there to protect the organization, but can be beneficial to reducing their and their family's risk of falling prey to online threats, they are much more open to security policy and measures at work, more alert when it comes to risks associated with certain behaviors, and more likely to internalize a culture of security. Thanks everyone for watching. If you'd like to get in touch to talk security one password, feel free to send me an email. And if you want to learn more about one password or learned about security, have a look at the broad spectrum of courses on offer at One Password University. Bye. Oh man, thank you, Alex, for joining us. What an interesting presentation. I, I love the, the point around one size fits all, but badly. Uh, that quote from Hardage, I, that, was, that was awesome. Um, some great points around security and especially the human element. I know that really resonated with our audience today. We got a lot of uh, strong feedback on that as well. I can see that we already have a lot of questions coming in for you, Alex. Uh, I wish we could dig into all of them, but we're a bit short on time. Now, don't worry though, because uh, Graham from 1Password team is sticking around and he's been answering some questions on live chat. So you've uh, hopefully gotten some answers back there. We're also gonna make sure that all the questions asked go to the 1Password team. So they will get a chance to follow up with you. Uh, so please do keep those questions coming in and make sure that you take a moment now and fill out that poll. Again, that feedback is so important. Now, if you are really excited, and I'm sure that you all are, you're looking for more information right away. Uh, one quick and easy way to get some great content is to head to that handouts tab. You can download uh, from 1Password why you need a password manager now. So I saw a few questions coming in about password managers and how secure are they really? Uh, and, and when do they work and when do they not? So this has some great content for you. Make sure you go in, download that, read that later, and make sure you fill out the poll. Let 1Password know what you would like to hear from them. Uh, well, a big thank you to everyone who asked a question during that uh, session and to everyone who has filled out the poll. Uh, we have a little bit of extra excitement now. I'm, I'm sure you guys are still wrapped up in the content. You totally forgot about this, but we have another prize giveaway. So it is time for our second prize giveaway of the EcoCast. This is another $500 Amazon gift card. And again, reminder that you must be in attendance at our live webinar in order to qualify. And the second winner of a $500 Amazon gift card is Diana Berry of Connecticut. Diana Berry of Connecticut. Diana, I have to tell you, as a Green Gables fan, <laughs> I, I very much enjoy your name. Congratulations to you, uh, and we will follow up with you after the webinar. Don't forget, there's still one more chance to win one of those $500 Amazon gift cards, plus that $50 gift card that's going to the best question at the end of every session. So keep those questions coming in. Remember, we look at them after the fact, so even if they don't get uh, discussed in our live Q&A, you will get a chance to enter that. Okay, well, without any further ado, I think it's time we move along in our EcoCast because I am so excited to introduce our next presenter, Brandon McCaffrey, Lead Solution Strategist Architect at CyberArk. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us on the EcoCast today. I know you have just a ton of great content to cover here, so I'm going to hand the mic right on over to you. Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, nice. 
Nice to be joining you all today. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. So my name is Brian McCaffrey. I'm a solution strategy architect here at CyberArk. Uh, we're going to be talking about wrangling passwords, authentication, and identity today right, is our topic. Um, so I specifically work on the CyberArk Identity Business Unit, which covers kind of all of our IAM business suite as well as our, as well as our password management business suite. But with that, let's jump in. A quick history here. Uh, the password, right? What we're all talking about today. Um, the password was created, as many of you might know, in 1961. First computer system password was credited to a researcher at MIT. Uh, and as you can tell by the password, 1961 is right? the year we're talking about. And uh, didn't have a lot of password guidelines or hygiene at that time, of course. But now, 60 years later, 60 plus years later, I should say, um, we are still dealing with the password and a crazy innovative technology at the time. But as a result of its innovation and its success, uh, there have been plenty of challenges that have come along with kind of the widespread adoption of passwords. And I'm sure you've seen some highlighted today. We, of course, of course brought our own statistics as well uh, in terms of, you know, why is having a a challenge. Well, number one, employees are passwords, right? 34% of employees have admitted sharing passwords with other coworkers. You can imagine that number is probably even higher than most people are willing to admit. Um, and those employees, the you know, one downside to being an employee, eventually you, you leave, right? And so when employees leave, uh, over 48% have admitted that they've still had access to corporate systems when they've left usually through having a password to that system. And outside of employees maybe using passwords incorrectly, sharing passwords when they shouldn't, or using them after they leave, um, there's also the threat of outsiders, right? 40% of passwords have actually been stolen by password dumping malware. And you can see why. I mean, users are storing passwords still today in spreadsheets, in notepads, like in plain text. And it makes it easy. If you see that last statistic there, over 26 million passwords have been stolen out of Windows Notepad, Word, or PDF files. So even when employees and users have the best of intention and even maybe strong passwords, uh, there, there can be, still be attacks and vulnerabilities associated with that password. And all of this contributes to really the most important statistic around passwords, which I'm sure has been highlighted today, and that's that Stolen credentials are, are the number one cause of data breaches at organizations. And so if we want to talk about securing our business and securing organizations, which many of us as IT and security practitioners really think about, um, one great place to start is thinking about that password and how we can control that. And so CyberArk Identity's approach to this is likely um, in line with what you've heard today where, one, we want to reduce the reliance on passwords, right? Let's move towards a passwordless environment. But outside of just moving to, towards password, passwordless, which we all want to do, and many businesses have, uh, have, have shown that they've wanted to implement this for their use cases, there are still systems where passwords are going to be necessary. And so how do we control access to those systems? How do we secure those passwords? Well, CyberArk gives us a way to do that. And then lastly, we want to, with this platform that we're looking at potentially solving these, these use cases for us, we want to do that in a really intelligent fashion. So as we're solving for issues related to identity, issues related around passwords, we want that platform to let us know, hey, how are we doing in that adoption of the passwordless approach? And also, where can we improve? And can we automate some of these tasks as well? And starting with that first prong to this approach, the passwordless uh, perspective, uh, as we all know, many organizations are investing in passwordless. In fact, this, this quote from Gartner is almost a little dated, right? It's talking about 2022, here we are. But according to Gartner, by now, 60% of large and global enterprises and 90% of your uh, mid-sized enterprises, they're implementing passwordless methods today for more than 50% of their use cases. And that's up from 5% in 2018. So as you can tell, there's a lot of investment and thought in this area. 
CyberArk is absolutely thinking about it as well. How can we provide this for, for our customers? How can we solve the issue of passwords? And so one of the ways we've done that is through uh, SSO, right? So being an identity provider, CyberArk can be an identity provider for your organization and integrate with any system via SAML, OpenID Connect, all of those open SSO standards. So if you actually think about the impact for that, if you're an organization of, say, 1,000 employees, if you roll out SSO with CyberArk Identity and say, like, Workday, you've just eliminated 1,000 Workday passwords. You've eliminated thousands of passwords at the organization from one app. So if you can expand SSO to all of your enterprise applications, or as many as possible, you can really uh, do a great job at eliminating potentially weak passwords. And then on top of that, the identity provider themselves often tend to be password zero, right, where, where that password is starting. Well, CyberArk Identity has offered different ways to actually eliminate that password for the identity provider itself. So one of those ways is a patented way through our QR code scan technology that is extremely easy, convenient, and keyboardless, actually, to end users. So we've seen that as a very popular method for our customers to adopt passwordless. But on top of that, when you're signing into the portal, we can also do things like WebAuthn, uh, FIDO2, et cetera, where we can use those open standards to use things like biometrics to sign into CyberArk Identity and not have a password. And outside of just the, the portal for that integration, one place where a lot of um, vendors can fall short is the endpoint, right? So, okay, great, you've helped me eliminate my passwords to different enterprise SSO applications, but what are we doing for the endpoint? Well, CyberArk Identity can come in and actually integrate with your Windows and your Mac endpoints and give you password lists at the endpoint level. One of the most common uh, ways, again, from our customers is through that QR code keyboard list, password list technology. But of course, we can actually give you any uh, type of authentication method as a method to sign into those, authentic those endpoints. So think of mobile applications or even things like SMS messages or phone calls. We can provide all of that as other ways of accomplishing passwordless in the environment. The password list is great, right? We'd, we'd love to eliminate passwords everywhere we can, and CyberArk Identity helps us with that. But, the big but there, there are absolutely websites that businesses use that you don't control and you can't realistically implement password lists for. When we think about things like our corporate bank account or uh, e-commerce portals, like if we're signing into Amazon, for example, our corporate Amazon account, or shipping portals, like we're signing into our corporate FedEx or corporate UPS, um, or even social media accounts, like we're signing into our corporate LinkedIn. Many of those systems that you need to power your business don't offer any way to really accomplish passwordless authentication. So what do you do? Well, it, for every organization, there's a couple of different ways this is being tackled today realistically. One is through personal password managers, right? Password managers that were designed to be consumer grade, which is great. Um, that is awesome for password hygiene, right? You can use really strong, unique passwords. Uh, but there is a downside. One downside is that when that employee leaves, they now have those corporate credentials essentially in their personal password manager, and that's not great. And oftentimes these personal password managers are storing those credentials on the endpoint, right? They're locally cached onto the system, and the same is true for browser-based password managers where those credentials are stored locally on the endpoint. So if the endpoint gets popped, that's a vulnerability, right, for both of those uh, scenarios. So those systems can be great. Um, but inherently, uh, they are often tied into personal identities as well. So employees may actually be able to take some of those corporate secrets with them using those kind of uh, built-in password managers or personal password managers. Now, there is clear text that employees also store their passwords in. I mean, think about uh, sharing passwords over email or sharing them in like a spreadsheet. You'd be surprised how many customers uh, actually still before coming to us have had spreadsheets that departments are uh, sharing access to, and even sharing in things like Slack or Teams or uh, a SharePoint site in clear text. That's obviously not great. Again, same vulnerability exists if the endpoint gets popped. Really easy to grab those credentials then. And uh, 
uh, sharing credentials in that fashion just is, is not great. Other users might be able to get access to it that shouldn't have access to those credentials. And then, of course, there's you know, storing passwords in your head. Um, but if, unless you're a superhuman, it's going to be really difficult to remember uh, dozens or even potentially hundreds of different strong, unique passwords. So what are you going to do? You're oftentimes going to reuse a password. You might even make it a weak password as well. That's common for employees. So having employees store their passwords in their head isn't really a realistic option uh, for most organizations. And that's where workforce management, uh, workforce password management comes in from CyberArk. So we've talked about how CyberArk can help with the passwordless use case. So for all of those applications where you still need passwords, workforce password management has you covered. So CyberArk focuses specifically on helping enterprises and their employees store and create strong and unique passwords. And those passwords can actually be shared within the enterprise. So they can be shared in a secure fashion, let's say, between a department where not everyone can actually gain access to that password. They won't be able to see it or view it, but they can actually use that password functionally through CyberArk. So you can have really strong uh, sharing access in a time-bound fashion even if you want, uh, as well as the storage of these credentials is actually done in a way so it's not stored on the endpoint. These credentials are actually stored in a vault. And CyberArk can host that vault for you, or you can actually host that vault yourself. And so in this way, we can ensure that when a user leaves the organization, all of those credentials are in our enterprise vault. They're not in a user's personal password uh, management or on a user's local endpoint. So that way we can ensure it's stored in a very secure fashion with auditability built in. And the auditability uh, conversation actually brings us kind of to the future here, right, about uh, if we're investing in a platform like CyberArk Identity, we want to make sure there's intelligence built into that platform. And that's exactly what we've built for our customers, where we have behavioral analytics here. So you can get real-time functional dashboards of things like who is signing in to which application when, and where in the world are they signing in from, as an example. So we can start to gather all of this information of what applications are actually in use at the organization, what users are actually using those applications, and we can do deep dive uh, queries local to this platform to get a really, really good understanding of how are we doing uh, from a passwordless uh, from a passwordless standpoint. And on top of that, uh, CyberArk offers our identity security intelligence platform. That's actually where that behavioral analytics came from that you saw. But this platform actually integrates not only your web passwords that users are uh, saving and potentially things like notes or secrets that they're saving in CyberArk identity, but this also integrates with other CyberArk products that you may be using. So CyberArk, for example, has uh, historically been one of the leading vendors in privilege access management where we've been able to look at things like what is the user doing on that device. So we can actually use that to inform our access decisions for web applications. So for example, if a user tries to run PowerShell in admin on a device, well, we can use that piece of information, leverage a risk score, and say, hey, that's something the user shouldn't be doing. Maybe let's lock their web sessions. So let's actually go into all the web applications they're signed into, like Salesforce and Workday, and let's suspend that web session immediately. So we can now start to use things that are happening on the endpoint to actually influence and make decisions for what's happening inside of the web application we're managing access to. So that's a, a bit there on how CyberArk Identity addresses the uh, world of wrangling passwords, authentication, and identity. Uh, as we've talked about, one, we want to help you eliminate passwords where possible through our enterprise SSO integration uh, and through our own native passwordless capabilities. Two, we want to help you uh, really securely manage web applications and make sure we're doing that in an enterprise fashion via things like Workforce Password Manager and making sure things are shared in a secure fashion. And then lastly, we want to future-proof you, right? As you move forward, 
into the future, we want you to have a platform that you can grow into and really start to leverage for automated results. So before I jump into the next steps, there's one little demonstration I want to show everybody. So let me go ahead and share out my screen. If I can, we'll go ahead and jump into that demonstration. Perfect. Hopefully everyone can see my screen at this point. And now I'm going to go ahead and uh, show what we talked about from an endpoint perspective. When we're signing into the endpoint, uh, let's go ahead and sign in as our user, Joe Smith. So Joe can go ahead and sign into this Windows device. You'll see he has a number of options outside of a password to leverage to get into this Windows machine. I'm going to go ahead and use our QR code scan to get in. So I can pull up my CyberArk Identity application, which I'm doing right now on my phone. And I can go ahead and scan this QR code scan. Before I can scan the QR code, we have a biometric gate. So I can go ahead and unlock that biometric gate and then scan our QR code. And then just like that, we've been signed into our Windows device as that user. So in a completely passwordless fashion, we're now able to access our endpoint. And when we're signed into an endpoint already, like I'm signed into this endpoint now with another user, John, uh, we can see that on top of being signed into the endpoint, uh, before running any task on that endpoint, we can actually go ahead and prompt that user for authentication as well. So if we're running a privileged task, like running PowerShell as an administrator, we can go ahead and prompt the user for authentication. And in a fully passwordless fashion, they can go ahead and authenticate themselves. In this case, I'm going to use an OTP code to authenticate myself as this user. So instead of using a QR code, I'm now going to use your traditional OTP to sign in. So I'm going to go ahead and continue here. I could enter a code, but in this case, I'm just going to accept the push notification. And then just like that, I'm in. And now, only after authenticating for this privilege task, I've been signed in so I can do this Windows, so I can run Windows PowerShell as an administrator. So just like that, we've been able to now take a privilege task on our machine in a fully passwordless fashion with MFA uh, on top of it. And the last thing I want to point out is uh, the actual CyberArk Identity Portal experience, where if I go to our CyberArk Identity Portal as an end user, I can go ahead and actually use that same fashion that we use to get into our endpoint. I can go ahead and leverage that for our portal. So let me go ahead and pull up my application real quick, do my biometric scan. And then just like that, in a fully passwordless, keyboardless fashion, I've been able to scan our QR code and get into our portal. And now once I'm in the portal, I can see all of my applications that I have access to. I have my SSO applications like Salesforce and AWS right next to my password-based applications like Twitter or UPS. And I can drag and drop these apps anywhere I want them to. I can put, a, put them in tabs. It's really convenient as an end user. But also, we'll notice if we take a look at an application like Twitter, that's one of those applications that, as we mentioned, it doesn't support enterprise SSO. So in this case, uh, I have a user credential. Now, as an end user, I can't actually view this credential. So this credential has been shared with me, but I'm unable to see it or view it uh, outside of uh, CyberArk. And even in CyberArk, I can't view the, the credential itself. Now I could go ahead and give sharing privileges as well. So if I want to add someone from our corporate directory, I can go ahead and search for that user. So if Joe wants to share this app, uh, password with someone else on the marketing team, Jane, we can do that. We can make sure that Jane also is unable to view this credential. And if Jane is, let's say, a contractor that's working uh, for our marketing team, we can give her the access so long as she's a contractor, right, ahead of time. And of course, now when we save that, that's all going to be auditable. We can make reports, et cetera, on all of this behavior that the user is doing. And lastly, now if we want to go ahead and leverage Twitter, we can, with one click, sign into Twitter. That's through our browser extension. So we can go through the browser extension or the portal or even directly on Twitter's website. And then just like that, 
were signed into our uh, Twitter account. Outside of storing web credentials, CyberArk can also help you securely sort any credential by a secured item. So your internal applications uh, that might not be web-facing or things like your uh, Wi-Fi as an example, or your corporate Wi-Fi that you might want to share uh, access to, you can do that in the same kind of fashion where you can store any credential or any note you need in CyberArk Identity and again, share it with the appropriate users. Now when the user leaves, they'll no longer have access to any of these corporate credentials, so they're not taking them with them and we can actually automatically transfer some of these corporate credentials back to the manager or back to a specified user. I'm going to go ahead and unshare my screen. And hopefully we're back at the next steps now. So with next steps here, we can go ahead and uh, jump into the next step. So I would say, uh, based on this presentation, uh, what, what do you want to do next? Right? Where, where should we start? Well, first, Evaluate your IT landscape and try to understand where you're actually using passwords. Are you using passwords on the endpoint? Are you using passwords for your IDP? Are you using passwords for uh, different third-party corporate systems that are realistically being accessed with the organization? Start to get a handle on where all of those passwords exist, and then you can start to tackle each individual use case to get rid of those passwords. Uh, number two, you know, understand what controls are in place for the areas where you're not able to eliminate passwords. So are those going through a corporate proper enterprise workforce password management solution? Um, if not, maybe think about, you know, is that something that we should implement at our organization to make sure that users aren't storing passwords in an insecure way or taking passwords with them? And then lastly, if you think CyberArk could help with anything that uh, we've talked about today in terms of uh, you know, weak passwords and managing those in a secure fashion, well then check us out at cyberarc.com uh, and please it, learn more about specifically potentially the CyberArk workforce password management solution for any of those systems that still do require a password and passwordless isn't possible. Uh, great. So with that, thank you everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed this presentation and we can go ahead and get into our Q&A. Awesome. Well, thank you, Brandon. That was uh, just a great presentation and, and a really cool demo. Um, and I, I love the approach. You know, you said early on at the start, you know, reducing the, you know, that kind of two-step approach, or I, I think you had three, but reducing passwords where we can, and then securing remaining passwords that can't be removed. And I thought that was a nice balance of sort of strategy and reality for the world that we live in. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that, Jeff. Yeah, well, uh, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Before we jump into those, I do want to point out that we have uh, that poll up on our screen right now. So please do take a minute, fill that out, let CyberArk know what you would like to learn, what additional information you would like to receive. Uh, again, just an excellent way to reach out directly to CyberArk and, and have that information handed right back to you. So <laughs> keeping things nice and easy here, make sure you do fill out that poll uh, and CyberArk will be in touch. Uh, and we have, I, you know, I want to pass on, uh, as I said, we've got a lot of great vibes here today and we've gotten some high fives uh, for, for you and for your presentation, Brandon. So thank you very much for that. Uh, let's, let's dive into some questions. You ready? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Okay, perfect. All right, well, you know, one question, and, and we, you know, we do hear this a lot sometimes in, in fields where you've got a couple of different solutions available uh, and people are trying to make decisions. So what is something that really makes uh, CyberArk stand out? What, what is sort of some top unique uh, that you would offer? Uh, poof, that, that's a tough one, uh, honestly, <laughs> because there's so much there. But uh, I would say if you're talking about you know, specifically the workforce password management that we kind of highlighted a lot today. Uh, one mm -hmm. big difference between us and kind of like your traditional uh, consumer password managers uh, is that we have created this product completely focused on the enterprise. So that has given us uh, different kind of security features we were able to build in, like not storing credentials on the endpoint as an example, um, additional visibility and audit that we've really thought hard about for our uh, customers, which tend to be some of the, the largest 
you know, like Fortune 500 customers so that we can give them reports that make sense right out of the box and actionable data. Um, and then, yeah, the last thing I would say is, again, that ability to store it in the vault. And that vault can, doesn't just have to be a cloud-hosted vault. You can actually self-host it yourself as well, uh, which is very compelling to a lot of, like, banks and government agencies and um, kind of some of those large organizations that want to be able to store credentials on their own. So I, I want to talk about the vault because we did get a question about that and just sort of I think it's always a little scary to somebody when they're, um, you know, putting all their eggs in one basket or one vault, so to speak. Uh, so can you talk about the security around that password vault? Because the question asked was, well, what if somebody gets in there? Then they have access to everything. Yeah, great question. So uh, the vault is, uh, d depending on where you store it, if you host it yourself, then you're actually securing that vault in your own fashion. Um, mm. So uh, that that would be hardened with kind of the best practices around your privilege access management vault. So you're going to be hardening your servers that you're storing that on. You're going to be making sure that any users that have access to the vault that uh, they all have that access in a least privileged fashion. So no kind of one user just has access to all credentials on that vault. They only have access to the credentials as appropriate uh, inside that vault. And then additionally, if you're looking at things like our cloud vault, we do end-to-end uh, -end encryption on that. So the credentials are uh, secured kind of in an end-to-end -end fashion once they're being stored. Uh, and then of course on you know CyberArk itself, we're, we're hosted on AWS, we have uh, encryption not only at our tenant level, uh, or excuse me, not only at our pod level where we have multi, a multi-tenant structure, but we also have encryption on the actual tenants themselves. So there's two layers of encryption there um, to, to pop. And then, it, of course, if anyone actually gained access to the vault, then all of those credentials are stored in a hash, salted, encrypted fashion. Uh, so it would have to be something that, that horrible, horrible incident, and it would only be specific to a singular customer uh, if that was the case that the, the Cloud Vault was um, uh, was popped. But we, we CyberArk itself uh, actually acts as a pen tester for many of our customers. And of course, we go through uh, uh, pen testing yearly. We have our own internal red team and a bug bounty to ensure that our, all of our systems are secured in kind of the, the best fashion possible. So uh, what do you think about expiring passwords? <laughs> yes yes or no is a question that was asked. And we, we oh had this God, came up I in our pet peeves. Yeah. <laughs> I love that question so much because it's like a philosophical almost like question. I mean, there, there is a practicality to it, but it's also deeply philosophical in my opinion. So um, <laughs> I, I, I think that rotating passwords, personal opinion, I think it can – cause more harm than good in certain situations. There are systems like your domain credentials, for example, or uh, your uh, like Linux servers, where CyberArk actually would suggest rotating those credentials, but doing it in an automated fashion. So CyberArk can actually rotate those credentials for you, check them in and out of a vault, and then give you kind of all the auditability around that. So I would say there are systems that exist like CyberArk that are built to make that password rotation automatic. So it's not a hassle to your users. But when you're thinking about systems that users are actually accessing themselves, I think if they can keep a really, really strong password, then you know rotation is not as necessary as frequently. That said, I still think there needs to be some level of password rotation. Just you know, over time, systems get exposed and passwords get out there on the internet, and we, we should probably be rotating those passwords. But I love the question uh, because, yeah, I think maybe like every 30 days is excessive uh, as an example. <laughs> Cost outweigh the benefits. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of weekly <laughs> rotations. I mean, it's just a, a just a nightmare. But uh, and, and it did. It came up on our pet peeves list this morning. We heard from a lot of audience members that that one is, is on their minds. So thank you for delving into that <laughs> philosophical discussion for us today. Uh, and I wish we could keep going, Brendan, because we do have a lot of great questions for you. But unfortunately, we are a little short on time. So we're going to have to wrap there. Before you run away from us, though, uh, if somebody's looking to get started right away, you would put some uh, contact info up. Um, actually, let me just see. I'm going to can I bounce back to that? 
Eh, nope, lost it. Uh, okay, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what do they do? How do they get started with CyberArk? What's their first step? Yeah, great question. So the website's probably the first step. You can sign up for a free account, actually, that we have. Uh, it's CyberArk Identity. So if you search CyberArk Identity free trial, you can get started with a free trial. Uh, you can ask for a demonstration. And if you want to get in touch with me, I think my LinkedIn is somewhere on here. So, you, you know, always feel free to reach out to, to me personally as well. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and my email is my name at fiberarc.com. So feel free to shoot me a note too. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so make sure to follow up with Brandon. If you have any questions, definitely go visit CyberArc. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today for that presentation and demo and for sticking around to answer some questions. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. All right, well, and a big thank you to everyone who filled out the poll and asked a question. I do want to remind you again that those questions do go to CyberArk, so uh, you will get an answer back if we did not get to your question today. So please do keep those coming. Um, and uh, if you are looking for more information right away, you can actually head to that uh, Handouts tab and uh, click on the CyberArk link. There's an opportunity to download the ebook, Buyer's Guide to Identity and Access Management Solutions in a Zero Trust Era. Yeah, definitely a, a good read, absolutely fascinating. So make sure that you head on over there and check that out. A little light afternoon reading for you all after the webinar wraps today. Uh, but for now, let's keep wrapping or rolling along here because, folks, I don't know how this has happened already, but we are actually at our last session of the day. We are already coming to our very last presenter. Every, every time it seems to surprise me. Uh, so here we are, and I am so excited to introduce our very last presenter, the grand finale to bring it all home for us. We've got Nelson Mello here with us, product evangelist and founding engineer at Beyond Identity. Nelson, thank you so much for joining us on the Ecocast today. I know you have a lot of great info to cover, and uh, you're, you're going to bring us home uh, in style. And you know what? I will join you on camera uh, at the end of this, and we'll do a little bit of live Q&A face-to-face. So uh, Nelson, over to you. Thank you, Jess, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nelson Mello. I'm a founding engineer and product evangelist here at Beyond Identity. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about MFA and a um, little bit about how we do it and, and how it's different. Um, so for those that are not familiar with our company yet, um, we like to say Beyond Identity is a security capital S company that is really focused on solving an identity problem. And what we mean by that is we look at things like authentication processes and types of credentials, uh, fun stuff. And um, we try to not, not only focus on the identity side of it, but also um, uh, have a point of view from the security practitioner side, uh, folks who are interested in improving those processes for users and administrators alike. Um, We've heard today uh, some folks touch on NIST and the dig digital identity guidelines, uh, that document, and how it could be interesting for uh, this webinar. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to cover a few items specifically about password guidelines and that section of that document and how we think about them uh, beyond identity. Um, uh, so kind of a, a careful read of that section gets you things like what's on the right side here. Um, use show password settings or password managers or integrate security into password, password storage methods. Um, and all those sound great uh, in terms of following the, the letter of the law. Um, I think there's really nothing wrong with any of those things. things. Um, but can we, can we do something a little bit better? Can we do things like, hey, Rather than use a credential that's just bad by design, can we use unfishable credentials? Um, and maybe when, when we're at it, um, bind users to their devices so that uh, for OSs and, and vendors like that do that, um, how can we get those credentials to be generated so that users can automatically get a measure of a possession factor um, rather than having to continually go and pick up their phone or use their hardware key to prove the second factor that they're expected to prove. And I think really the, the TLDR of all this is you can make sure that your systems are compliant with NIST guidelines by implementing some of the things on the left, uh, but also you could shore up your passwords uh, and do better uh, with, with some other newer technologies. 
So can we explore some of those ideas? Um, it's been interesting to see recent progress for me uh, for operating systems and browser manufacturers that uh, have made support have made supporting credentials that are based on uh, strong cryptographic principles much easier. Um, you may be familiar with the announcement from January 6, from June 6, for all three Apple, Google, and Microsoft that decided to call their web authen or FIDO credentials passkeys. Uh, I think that's a fantastic term. I really like it. Um, we're planning to use it for all of our stuff. Um, but because the thing is, passkey sounds like password. They're like a password, but they have a key on them. They have a public private key pair inside of them. Apple calls them digital keys. Um, I think that's intuitive for users, easy to imagine, uh, a great step in the right direction. Uh, but really, passkeys in the parlance of Microsoft, Apple, and Google really refer only to one thing, which is WebAuthn or FIDO keys that are generated through a platform authenticator. They're stored by the operating system. Um, and themselves, they sometimes could be stored on the cloud, just an interesting security property. Um, uh, at our company, we've been thinking about this and, and we kind of decided that's not enough. Um, it seems like pass keys could be useful in all, kind, all kinds of contexts. Just think about all the places where you, you can find public private key pairs, all the protocols that support them, uh, uses for them. So for example, can we use a passkey as a type of credential inside a native um, SDK for a mobile app? Um, or maybe a desktop application that uses that native SDK? Um, what about as a signer for a remote transaction uh, where it may not be appropriate to generate a key in, inside the context of the remote device itself? but you can certainly generate attestations for users that are trying to authenticate with those keys and pass those along. So um, next use case, how about using it as a trust anchor? So um, as an employee of an organization that maybe I'm a contractor or I'm using BYOD devices, how can I add those devices to the context, the security context of my organization in a way that first of all, doesn't use shared secrets but also give security administrators a measure of how secure those devices are. Um, so those are three typical scenarios that, that we've been considering, which takes me to our next topic, which is um, when we think about pass keys uh, or really public private key pairs of any sort, uh, they're useful in, in all those scenarios. Um, how can we create um, less friction and more control for applications that are using embedded SDKs that generate pass keys, um, use it for web authenticator or web authentication applications, um, maybe with no code or web applications that are um, using the, the FIDO authenticator and mechanisms to use those keys. Um, how about maybe an application that's a platform authenticator and you don't have to build it yourself. You can rely on existing technology, just integrate with standard authentication protocol, SAML OIDC, and then you get a great storage for those credentials for your employees, for your contractors, and you can satisfy those use cases. Um, or maybe you have remote um, authentication mechanisms that you need to support, like a VDI uh, or other devices that you ne don't necessarily want to put a key on. Uh, how can you create roaming authentication capabilities for your applications so that existing trusted devices can be used to authorize other devices. So to address all those needs, uh, we've designed what we call the Beyond Identity Universal Passkey Architecture. Um, there are a few components to that. Uh, on the left side, uh, there's a device which sort of by design already supports if one of a few authentication mechanisms. It could be a local biometric, could be a, a local PIN, um, and they're they're built in a way that you can leverage trusted execution environments or hardware rules of trust to generate keys on them and protect those keys using the same mechanism that the, the device uses to trust you. So we place a key there, let's use them for um, authentication for all different kinds of systems. Um, then SDKs on the cloud, where if you're building your own application or you have a single sign-on system, you can integrate into uh, the devices and, and look for the presence of those keys. Um, and then if you find the right one, 
uh, compared to the public key uh, that's stored in the identity on our cloud and implement authentication rules based on a policy engine. All of that um, can be integrated with existing CRM, fraud and analytics systems um, and stored in existing log aggregation mechanisms that, that you can use later. Um, which takes me into device trust. So in a typical identity ecosystem, and here I'm mostly referring to workforce and, and um, those kinds of uses of identities, but also applications. There, it may have applications in customer authentication. Um, we usually find a few well-known tools. Uh, we find SSOs, we find uh, endpoint management tools, SIMs. Um, most companies with a security program have some kind of, of uh, combination of these tools. Um, usually the SSO sits on the front lines and it's the main um, integrator between applications, directory, anything else that's going on. Um, and until relatively recently, those SSOs were kind of quite happy just doing the basics. Uh, some of them are still are doing that, uh, which is checking for password, something you have, and can I hear the magic word, and something you are uh, using a phone or, or something based on a push notification. Um, but are they really considering all of that rich context that exists on the device? Um, and are, are we just talking about the user uh, that holds the phone in their hand? Or could we get into the device that's holding the, the public private key pairs, the pass keys, and get richer context from that um, and use that to issue a session from the SSO? That's some of the things we've been thinking about uh, beyond identity. Um, compare... Uh, Add that to continuous authentication. Can we do that more than once after the user, maybe even after the user has established their first session? And if that posture for the device changes, how can we interact with the EDR or the SIM or the SSO and make changes to the sessions and the level of authorization that user has? And we plan to do that from any operating system uh, for um, integrations with CrowdStrike and, and others, which takes me into um, one specific example of how we've created those integrations. Um, it's via partnership with uh, CrowdStrike, and um, we're specifically looking for something they've, they've created, which is the Zero Trust Score. Um, it's an API level integration where, uh, based on the, the state of the device, they're computing a score from zero to one. And that can be used to check that score as the session goes on. And if the score changes or the posture of the device changes, then use CrowdStrike itself to make uh, adjustments to the level of trust that session has. Um, a specific adjustment you can make is maybe quarantine that device and not let the user continue to make authentication or uh, continue to make network requests uh, based on the session they had. And with that, um, thank you for the time and back to you, Jess. Well, thanks, Nelson. That was so interesting. I, I love this sort of passwordless world that you're describing. Uh, it sounds like a beautiful place. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> I think so too. All right, well, we have some great questions coming in from the audience already. I wanna make sure that we can get to as many as possible with the time that we've got left. So Nelson, you ready to dive in? Let's do it. Okay, awesome. All right, well, I think this one's actually a, a good one to start with, kind of the, the 101. So one of our audience members is wondering, is passwordless any more secure than password-based authentication? Oh, man, that's such a great question. Um, so it can be, um, but uh, I think when I find passwordless solutions, um, I, not all are created equal, right? And maybe some questions that I like to ask are, um, first of all, architecturally, are you really hiding a shared secret? And uh, I see some folks arbitraging the, the shared secret between different devices and systems. Um, or have you taken a more fundamental approach that removes that shared secret and uses other primitives to authenticate the user? That's number one. Um, and maybe another one is, have you considered... Um, kind of which opportunity for phishing that other solution introduces for you. Um, one good thing to, to ask is who initiates the request for authentication? Is that the user? Is that um, a third party or could it be a third party? 
and how many times can they do so? Uh, so you don't get in a situation where uh, a user is just getting bombed with requests and they don't necessarily know what to do and, and say okay to anything that comes through. So um, that's that's a few things that you could look into. That's a super interesting point here. You think you've you know put this extra armor on, but really you've potentially created another access or weak point in your armor. I don't know how you yeah. wear armor. So <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good good thing to consider and and uh, and helpful tip. Um, okay, so um, in in your presentation, Nelson, uh, you actually use the term uh, universal passkey architecture. So we have someone here wondering, what do you actually mean by universal? Ah. So when we imagine um, a world where you take the passkey that's just just living on a on a walled garden, maybe inside the Apple the ecosystem, and and you use it on more devices, uh, what could that could that look like? Could it be where uh, you're not necessarily relying on the the browser and the operating system to synchronize keys for you, uh, because they I think naturally don't like to do it with other operating systems. Uh, but binding those keys to a single identity and and using it on your Chrome OS device that um, you have at home and, and it's a device you use for checking email when, when you're off. Um, or for your Linux device that other browsers or manufacturers may not be that interested in supporting for you. That's what we say, but what we call universal pass keys is all devices using standards um, and all the platforms and browser combinations that, that you could get with security for the private key built into the system. Okay, so when you say universal, you mean universal, everything. Everywhere. <laughs> well, perfect. Uh, very literal, I like that. Uh, you refer referenced attaching um, to code repos. What exactly does that accomplish? Ah. Uh, um, so that's another one of those where you start sort of taking the the premise of using public private key pairs for all types of authentication and signing things, and you start encountering really cool scenarios where you can look into developer flows, and that's something that's been pressing for some folks in in recent times with um, the the pipeline attacks and and things that come from code provenance kind kind of questions. Um, some folks are familiar with uh, the ability to sign commits for any code that goes into a repository. It could be um, product repositories, or it could be SRE repos with infrastructure and things that are pretty sensitive. How do you make sure that commits come from developers that you know and from devices that you expect for anything that comes into that repo? Hmm. Okay, perfect. I'm going to sneak in one last question. We're getting pretty close to our time here. But uh, Nelson, if, if somebody's really excited and, and ready to jump in with Beyond Identity, which I know all of you out there are, what do they do? What's their first step? Great question. Um, so we have an excellent um, sales team that you can reach out to. There's a demo button on our homepage. Um, and super technical folks that can walk you through how to use our solution which use cases you can consider. Um, there's three of them, just as a, as a quick um, a preview. There's uh, for your workforce, sort of employees and contractors, for your customers, folks that you do business with, uh, or for your IT personnel or developers. And it's kind of uh, going after those use cases for code provenance. Awesome, lots of great ways to get started. Uh, and I do see that we still have a lot of great questions here. Um, so I do wanna assure everyone in the audience, again, a reminder uh, that the Beyond Identity team will get all of the questions that you asked. So anything that we didn't get to in the live session today, you will get a follow-up. Uh, Nelson, if you have some time, you're welcome to stick around in live chat as well. Um, but thank you again so much for joining us. This has been just an absolutely fascinating discussion. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Jess. All right, well, I'm going to hop off camera again and get back on my mic so that we can do that wrap up poll. So just give me one second here.
Okay, so here is that poll for you all. What additional information would you like to get from Beyond Identity? Again, and I'll keep saying it, this feedback is so important. How often are you sitting in a room uh, with the individuals that you're, you're learning from? Um, and that's effectively what we're doing here is virtually sitting around the table. And this is an opportunity for you to raise your hand and say, hey, this is, this is the information that I want to hear more about. So please do raise those hands uh, and, and click on that. Let us know. Uh, what additional information you would like to get from Beyond Identity. I also want to say thank you. You know, I have to say this has been one of the, the most engaged groups we've had. Uh, I, I love all the responses through live chat. We do, you know, we see them, we, we're reading them, and, uh, and it really adds to the energy of the, the whole experience. Um, Trevor, thank you. I just uh, said that he, he really enjoyed the discussion. Jason just said that this whole webinar has been excellent. All the uh, speakers have been really compelling. We really appreciate that. And there's just been so many good vibes today. So I love that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being so engaged. Um, if you are looking for more uh, information from Beyond Identity right away, head on over to that Handouts tab. Now I'm just going to remind you in general, there's, it's just jam-packed with resources. So click on a few. Uh, if, you, if you head to the Beyond Identity link, you can actually go right to their website. So if you were thinking that you'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time getting to know them a little bit better, and I highly recommend that. Uh, some great resources. You can also book a demo, and we all know that the best way to get to know a solution is to uh, get a demo and, and really start actually kind of working with it a little bit. So uh, please do, do uh, take advantage of that. Um, thank you, Greg. Just got a high five from Greg. I'm loving this. I'm just Now I'm just reading out the, the praise we're getting because it's making me very happy today. Uh, well, anyways, I, I do want to send another thank you to Nelson, to the Beyond Identity team. They're always a pleasure to work with. And uh, I know that you guys are all sitting there saying, okay, Jess, thank you very much, and get to it, because we have one more prize giveaway today. Uh, and so we're going to get to that last prize drawing. I'm going to remind you all again that you must be live in the webinar today. And we will get in touch with all three winners after we wrap today. So the final winner of a $500 Amazon gift card is Harry O'Loughlin of California. Harry O'Loughlin of California, you have won a $500 Amazon gift card. I'm going to read that list again. The, the three winners from today are Sean Stebner of Oregon, Diana Berry, best friend of, of Anne <laughs> Shirley, uh, and also of, of Connecticut. Harry O'Loughlin of California, you guys have all won a $500 Amazon gift card. Please do remember that you are all entered to win uh, the $500, or excuse me, geez, the $50. <laughs> Best, don't hold me to that. The $50 best question for each session. Uh, if you answered a question today or asked a question today, you are entered in that drawing. Even if we did not uh, read your question out, we will review all the questions after the fact. We choose that best question uh, in, in conjunction with the team. Uh, and then we'll make sure that you get that. So we will follow up with you. Okay, well that's enough about prizes. Uh, let's, let's talk about doing this again. So if you're on the webinar today and you would like to chat with us about presenting at a future Ecocast or a Megacast webinar, as you can see, lots of good vibes, lots of awesome uh, information and content, you should come and be a part of it. So we'd love to hear from you. Reach out uh, via email at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And one more exciting piece of information here, speaking of cool things coming up. We do have a megacast next week on Thursday, August 4th. We're going to be discussing zero trust security. I love this topic. Uh, it's, it's just really interesting to dig into. You know, kind of what we talked about today, there's a lot of that blend of technology and philosophy and ideology as a meeting solution. So it's just really interesting. Come, come and talk to me. Um, so that will be next week. That's August 4th at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and I do really want to send another thank you on behalf of the actual tech media team to Ping Identity, Okta, 1Password, CyberArk, and Beyond Identity for making this Ecocast possible. I hope that you've all gotten some really interesting insight into passwords, authentication, and identity, and how you can leverage new solutions into solving some of those common issues and complaints around these important topics. Uh, I know I've learned a ton. My brain's still kind of buzzing. And I want to uh, extend that again, that special thank you to everyone who attended, asked some awesome questions today, uh, and uh, participated in the polls. It's just been a great day. So I hope to see you all uh, at the Zero Trust Security uh, 
uh, Megacast, which will be next week. Again, head on over to the um, uh, Actual Tech Media. Boy, it's the end of the session and my brain just melted. The Actual Tech Media events calendar, so <laughs> check that out. Uh, and make sure to visit us for an event again soon, a webinar again soon. And until then, I hope that you all have an absolutely beautiful rest of your day, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.